Um, and so today what I want, what we're going to focus on is visualization. So we are starting from the assumption that you guys already do know how to do the basics of bringing a plot up. So I'm not going to cover the very, very raw basics of bringing a plot up. Um, did everyone get the uh, announcement from vSpace about what you had to download? So the URL is right there. For those of you who are already nicely using Git, you can grab it, you can clone it from Git, and that way you can get real-time updates. Those of you who are not using Git, you can download this just by clicking on the download button. And then it'll give you a zip file where you can grab the current state of the repository. And what we have here is a bunch of notebooks. And we're going to go through several of them today. There's probably more material here than we can reasonably cover in three hours, but we'll do our best. And the rest of it will be reference material for you guys. So um, hopefully this will work for everyone. And uh, if not, let me restart my notebooks. So here I have a terminal, which is in, that, in, the, in a checkout of that directory. And what I am going to run is the same thing that all of you are going to run, which is to type IPython notebook. That's all you need to type. And that should bring up a web browser. It may take a couple of seconds to come up. In my case, it shouldn't be too much because I had it open already. So when you type IPython notebook, you should get a message like this. And that it tries to open a browser. It does its best to open a browser. I hope that most of you will follow along and type with me. All of these documents that are up there are meant for you guys to work along. Um, if it doesn't work at all for you, you can view them and we'll put up, Paul was going to put up PD, static PDF copies of them that you could use to copy and paste from if this doesn't work at all for you. Um, but ideally, hopefully throughout the semester, you will have your setup so that this is uh, as smooth as it is there. We can just uh, type this and bring up a, a browser, OK? So the browser that has to come up has to be either, we do our best to detect, but if it doesn't work completely, I want to point this out. It has to be either Chrome or Safari or Firefox 7 or newer. So any of those three will work. Internet Explorer is a no-go. It d doesn't work at all. And Firefox, Opera has problems, and Firefox older than 7 can be made to work, but it's a little kludgy. So does, is there anyone in the room for whom one of those is not enough, who has none of those? No Safari, no Chrome, and no Firefox newer than 7, 7 or newer. OK, so we seem to be covered browser-wise. And if you guys all have the, the NThought distribution installed, the current version, you should see something like this. And so before we dig, let me close the ones that I had opened beforehand so that we start fresh. Oops, that I didn't mean to close. That was documentation. OK, so we're going to start by looking at this one, the structured D-types introduction. This isn't strictly visualization, but it's a little bit of an explanation that we need to see for everyone to understand what we're going to do later. And it's a piece of NumPy that may have gone by a little too fast during the boot camp or the introduction you've had, uh, you've had so far. So it's important to at least review the basics. So can everyone, is, the, is the font size big enough for the people in the back? Or do I need to crank it up a little bit? OK. OK. So we'll leave it that way so that we can fit a little bit more on the screen. And I'm going to full screen my browser so that I can see everything. So this is a very quick introduction to D-types, to, to what are called structured D-types. So a, a, NumPy, a NumPy array can be thought of as a linear chunk, a linear chunk of memory with boxes in it. Hey, Paul, um, did you put the PDFs, the static I PDFs, up somewhere? Them. Oh, you did. There's a zip of them on the resources. On the resources on vSpace. On okay. So if anybody doesn't have, can't bring these things up to work for you. On vSpace, Paul just uploaded PDFs, these same things, but in PDF, so you can read and you can copy and paste into a normal IPython session if, if this doesn't work for you, OK? So a, nor a NumPy array can be thought of as a linear chunk of memory where in each box you have an element. And let's say that there are six of these. And then there's a little bit of metadata somewhere that says, think of these six numbers as a three by two array, for example. So think of these as having two rows of three elements each. So there's, there's a part of the, of the array that tells NumPy how to interpret the, the geometry of this. 
but very importantly, there's a piece that tells it what's on the inside. What does, it con what is, what does each cell contain? Does it have an, an integer? Does it have a floating point number? So the basic arrays that you've seen so far have regular numbers, regular scalars in them. Integers, floating point number, complex numbers. But it turns out that NumPy allows you to specify the type of what goes in there. So you can actually say, look, in here, every single one of these elements is actually itself something that has structure. And I have a floating point number here, another floating point number here, and I actually have a vector of two floating point numbers, for example. So you can have, and then, so you, have a th a, you can have a three by two array, but where every element is actually has internal structure. Why would you want to do that? Well, imagine, for example, you're trying to represent, you're doing a fluid simulation, and you're trying to represent, and let's keep it 2D just for simplicity of shape, you're trying to represent the pressure, the velocity, and the temperature of a fluid in a 2D, in a 2D flow, so you're gonna discretize, you're gonna discretize your domain as a grid, but at each point in here, right, at each point which represents the physical space, this thing has pressure, temperature, and velocity, right? Pressure, temperature, or velocity would be described by this kind of structure. A floating point number, a floating point number, and velocities in the x and y directions, right? So it would be nice if you could represent in your array, if you could say my array has these many x by these many y grid points, and at each point I have pressure, temperature, and velocity. And NumPy allows you to do that, precisely that. So what we're doing here is we're starting um, PyLab support so that, uh, so that IPython imports preloads NumPy and matplotlib so that we can do arrays and plotting automatically. So we're going to type this. And once we switch gears into, into, uh, into matplotlib, I'll explain the di what that inline word means. For now, you can just type that. How do you execute cells in this notebook? You type shift enter. If you simply type enter, each of these cells, each of these things right here, is effectively like a mini script where you can keep, keep on adding text. When you want to run all of it, you type shift enter and it executes the entire cell. So this is how we specify that we have, that we want an array whose internal structure consists of pressure, temperature, and velocity. We make an object called the NumPy D-type. A D-type is a specific type of Python object that is used by NumPy precisely for the purposes of describing the memory layout of data. So you say, I have a D-type which is contains the names P, T, and V, and the formats float, float, and a two-element float array. So this is the syntax now. There's, there's, there are several ways of creating D-types. The, the syntax is actually very flexible. I am not going to go over all of them. Right here, there's a link to the documentation on how, oops, let me open this in a, in a, new, in a new tab. This is the, document, the NumPy documentation on how to create these D-types. There's multiple syntaxes. It's fairly elaborate. We're not we could spend two hours on this alone. All I'm going to do is show you this much. So once you create this D-type that describes exactly the example I gave here, now you can say, give me a three by three. Let's imagine our grid is only three by three for simplicity. Give me a three by three grid of that D-type. And now you can access, for example, you can say the pressure, I'm going to initialize the way you access these is like a dictionary. Square brackets, and the name of the field, we said there's a field P in as a string. So I want my pressure to be nor, uh, Gaussian distributed uh, numbers with a mean of 10 and a standard deviation of three. So you're going to initialize your simulation with random pressures around a mean of, of 10 millibars, say, and this, is, this sets all of the pressure field in all of the cells. Then you can say, you can ask for the pressure, and that's exactly a three by three array. You can then initialize the temperature to be at 300 Kelvin, for example. Um, and then you can initialize, how do you handle these that have more complicated structure? How do you say the velocities, I want them to be, have a mean of five, a standard deviation of two. But now, what kind of array do I have to create? Because this is a three by three array, but in each cell, the velocity itself is a two element array. So the shape of the velocity has to be three comma three comma two, because I have to have the two element arrays, the, the VX and VY components of the velo velocity at each point. So now if I print the velocity, this is the velocity. There's a two component vector at each of the nine locations in my three by three grid. So there you've been able to describe the fluid array 
if you, if you now type what is fluid, whoops, I haven't run this code, I'm sorry. Let me just run the whole thing. So the fluid array is that. The entire array, obviously it's kind of complicated to look at it because you're looking at all of the data for that, but here you've seen what each individual cell has. So you can see how powerful this idea is. Imagine that you're, Josh does a lot of this. They get a lot of data from instruments, cameras that actually pump binary data raw on the wire. You have an instrument that is detecting, doing uh, data collection, and all you know is that it pumps data with a certain layout in memory, but the, that data might have more structure than simply be raw numbers. You might want to group it in this way. All you have to do is tell NumPy what the layout of that data is in memory, and then you can absorb a raw binary chunk of data from an instrument or from a data file and represent it as a structured array. So this is very, very useful. You'll have many chances to use this, and there's gonna, we're going to have an exercise on this very shortly. Are there any questions on this? Okay, so this is... Are talking about the distinctions between this and rec arrays? Mm. Yes, so you can, because it's slightly inconvenient to type this, square brackets V, NumPy allows you, so let's do fluid R, B, fluid, and you can view this as what's called a rec array. What is the difference between uh, the normal one and the rec array? The only important difference is that the, whoops, in fluid, if you want to access V, the velocity, you have to do square brackets and quotes. In fluid R, you can do simply dot. Well, let me access the pressure because it's shorter so that you see the, the printout. So this is what happens. Fluid P doesn't, fluid.p doesn't work. You have to access it as square brackets and quotes. Fluid R.p does work and gives you the, the whole subarray in one shot. Now, there is one slight catch with, the, well, there's a couple of caveats with these. First, normal NumPy arrays already have a bunch of dot names after them. It's actually quite a long list of things that they have. So you can't have a name in your names that is any of the names of things that already exist in NumPy because you'll have a conflict. And NumPy will win, so your name will basically not be available. Now, you can always still access with the square bracket syntax. You're, you're not losing that, so this is only a convenience. The other caveat is that when you access, if you access one element of your array, right? for example, this is one element of the array Individual elements don't have the dot syntax anymore. So even though the overall array has the dot syntax, individual elements don't. That R. What's that? Fluid R. Fluid R, okay, sorry. Still the same error. Yes. I just wanted to... Sure, sure, yeah. <laughs> so even the fluid R, even though fluid R dot V has that, fluid R, you can't access an individual element. Now you can get from dot V the zero, zero element. This you can do but you have to get the entire fluid.v and then access its zero, zero element, which may be an inefficient way to go about it. In a loop, for example, you're creating the whole view just to get one of its elements. So in my mind, these are actually things, all of these things, all of these problems that I've just explained, we actually intend to fix them in NumPy. They are, they're all solvable, but this is the current state of NumPy. So the rec array view, this, by the way, doesn't copy the data. You're simply creating another object that has slightly more convenient syntax. I personally use the rec arrays very often just because I prefer the dot and typing. It's just much more convenient. But you have to be aware of these couple caveats they have so that you don't go, why does that not work? Especially this one, this one, the absence of this, the fact that this doesn't work, I think is really, um, the fact that this doesn't work really bothers me because I really think that should work. And it's kind of, Stefan, do you know why, uh, why that is? Just we haven't bothered to do it? No? What's the class after you slice? Like, what's the you get a void. So it's, a, it's because it's the opaque, it's the opaque container for a structured element. So you don't, you don't get, there's no, the problem is there's no, no such thing as a rec array scalar is the issue. Yes, question. So I'm just probably not understanding something. When you when you initialize V, I thought V had three components. No, two. Two? Yeah. Output, output seven, or, it's not like seven, output eight to 
Output eight. It's the no. It's uh, it's displaying a three by three matrix, but writing it out. So it's the nine elements. The grid is three by three. The spatial grid is three by three. At each point, there are two elements, v x and v y, if you will. Right? We specify the shape of the shape of v is two elements. It's right here. And so there is shape plus two because we have an extra internal degree of freedom. For those of you with a, with a physics background, you can think of these as internal degrees of freedom and the, this as the spatial degrees of freedom. This is how, how you would view it in classical sort of physics parlance. So in here, what you have is these nine elements just laid out one after the other. If you count braces, you have the same number of braces on the outside as here plus an extra pair of braces because now instead of a single number at each location, you have a vector. And you can, you can nest this to death. You can have a matrix. You can have within it D types within D types. You can go crazy to the point of making things completely incomprehensible. But for simple cases like this, it's a very handy data structure to have. Okay? And so what you get with this are effectively things like, ex you can think of these like Excel spreadsheets with, name, with named fields, but with n dimensional. Instead of only being rows, you can have arbitrary numbers of dimensions. Any other questions? Okay, so this is kind of one of the foundational data types in, in, in the NumPy, SciPy world. Um, and it builds, as I said, on top of standard NumPy. So now, after this brief review, and there's a link in there, there is a link to the page in the documentation that explains all of the, the syntax. Now we're going to switch into matplotlib beyond the basics. So I'm assuming that you guys already know how to do the basic matplotlib plotting, right? So now we're going to dig a little bit deeper into things that are not necessarily completely obvious in matplotlib out of the gate. And, uh, and we're going to try to understand things about matplotlib. So the reason why I asked you not to initialize the notebook with dash dash pylab was because I want to turn pylab support on on a notebook by notebook basis differently. Because I want to show you that there's two ways you can use you can use matplotlib, you can get figures in the, uh, when you're using the notebook. You can have the floating windows that you've had before, or you can have these inline figures that, are, that stay and they're kind of pasted into the document. And the inline figures are very nice because they stay with your document. The problem is that they're not interactive. You can't pan and zoom. If you want to get an inline figure centered around a particular point, you have to manually say, I want my x limits to be this and my y limits to be this manually. Whereas with the floating ones, you can just grab the mouse and zoom, zoom into the part of the data that you want to see. Okay? So eventually, we will enable in IPython the ability to toggle back and forth. Right now, we can't. We haven't finished that. It's, it's a little bit tricky to get it to work right. We haven't had the time to do it. So right now, it's a choice that you have to make at startup. If you start the notebook with dash dash pylab, you make the choice once and for all for every notebook in that session. If you don't do dash dash pylab, then you have the freedom of turning that on for each notebook separately. And so if you simply say percent pylab, yes, question. So the question is for the for the for the webcast. The question is whether whether PyLab only did import NumPy and SciPy things and Matplotlib things, or actually did something with the figures. The answer is it does both. PyLab is actually doing two things. First, it's doing a set of it imports all of NumPy, it imports all of Matplotlib, it imports PyPlot as PLT and NumPy as NP. Those are the things it does. But in addition to that, it selects which mat matplotlib backend to use. Matplot the, the architecture of matplotlib uses the concept of backends. The library renders to a generic API, and then a specific renderer generates actual images. And so we have to decide, do we render to an interactive window, or do we render to an, a window, or an image in a buffer that we send to the browser? And that choice has to be made when initializing the library. And so the pylab command does both, actually. But you get, so the question is, if you initialize with dash dash pylab only and don't say inline, what happens is you get floating windows. Yes. You get all of pylab, but with floating windows. If you say pylab inline, you get inline windows. And as I said, we, I have actually a patch that allows toggling back and forth. But I wrote it a while ago, and I haven't updated it, and it's kind of bit rotted. So I just need an afternoon to sit down and clean it up. Because the, ideally, what we want is to be able to go back and forth uh, between the two. So for now, we are going to use, um, well, actually, let's, let's do it 
in this mode for a second so that I can explain something. So I'm, going, so I'm starting it in PyLab mode. And in here, it told me that it's using the Qt backend. Right here, it says I've started with the Qt backend, which is the one that happens to be my default. It may be different for you guys. And when I run the next cell, I get two floating windows. Okay? So this is what happens when you don't say PyLab. When you don't say inline, I'm sorry, you get floating windows. So first of all, before we go back to the text, I want to show, for those of you who are not at the boot camp, very quickly, I want to show you the basic usage of these interactive windows so that you know how they work. So these, these are the matplotlib interactive windows, and they have a few buttons. And you're, depending on which operating system you're on, these buttons could be at the top or at the bottom. They're always the same. It doesn't matter. So the, the buttons allow you to do the following thing. First, let's concentrate on this one. This one allows you to, if you click on that, you go into pan and zoom mode. You get a little hand that allows you to simply pan around your data. Very useful. This one allows you to draw a rectangle and zoom into it. So you can draw rectangles and zoom into parts of your data. Once you've done a few of these operations that change the view of your data, then these three buttons begin to come important. These are inspired by the metaphor of a browser. In a browser, what do the arrows do? They take you back in the pages you've seen and forward in the pages you've seen. Well, think of each render of your data as a page. So these take you back. If I go back, I go back in my view history of my data. So if you've been zooming in, each of these will take you back one. And the forward button goes forward again until there's no more history. And home takes you to whatever that window started as. Whichever view of the data that window began as, that's what home does. So that's what these three buttons do. Zoom to rectangle. And now that you've seen that, let's return to the pan and zoom button. Because with the left mouse button, and on Macs, I don't know what you have to do to get a right click. But with the normal button, does pan. The right button does an in something interesting. It zooms, but keeping the point of origin fixed. So what it does is it allows you to zoom by keeping one position fixed. And it, zo it allows you to control the zoom rate on the x and y axis separately. So if you move the mouse right and left as you zoom, it only zooms the x axis. If you move the mouse up and down only, it only zooms the y axis. And if you move diagonally, it zooms both. And the ratio of zoom depends on the angle at which you move the mouse. It sounds funky, but once you get the hang of it, it's super handy. It's a great way of quickly zooming into your data. And because it keeps the point of origin fixed, it's a very easy way if you want to look at something, you click there, and you start zooming. And you're basically going into that part of the data very quickly. OK? <laughs> and finally, this one allows you to save your images. So you can save a static shot of the image to a file. You can save in multiple formats. You can save as PNG. Postscript, probably for, for you, the, the most important formats will be PNGs for web display and Postscript or PDF. Postscript, excuse me, Postscript or PDF for papers, depending on which journal you're sending it to. So this is all I want to say about these. There's a couple of other buttons for fine adjustments. Let's not spend more time on them, because we have a lot of ground to cover. If there are any questions, I'll be happy to return. But this, these are the basics of using these floating windows. So they're very handy for interactive data exploration. Um, and you can create static figures from them at any point. Now, even if you are using the interactive windows, you can, in the notebook, still get static snapshots of these figures. There's a command called display that allows you to display any figure. So matplotlib has a concept of getting a specific figure, get current figure. So matplotlib has a concept of getting the current figure. And if you say the GCF command gets the current figure. So if you say display and you get that figure, display GCF, it will display, it will paste that figure in here. In this case, it does it at a fairly high resolution. And if you have, if you have, the, if you have made more than one figure and you have specific variables holding the figure, you can actually display whichever one you want. Or you can say, oh, I wanted figure 2. You can say figure 2, which makes the figure 2 be the current figure and display GCF. And that will paste the second figure. Okay? So the fact, that you're using that, the fact that you're using the floating windows doesn't prevent you from having static images of your figures. Yes, Stefan, question? Can you just show how to assign a name when you construct the figure? Yes. 
So if instead of doing this, let me close these guys, let me close them all. So if instead, if I had saved these figure handles, let's say that this is figure two, and I make explicitly a figure, So I get the exact same thing as before, but now I have two variables, f1 and f2, that represent my figures. I can just say f1 and display it, just as if it was a variable. So the, Python note, the IPython notebook, if you have assigned the figure object to a variable, then you can simply hit the variable, and just as if it was a number, it would print. If, if f1 was the value 3, it would print 3 there. It prints the figure. What it does is it grabs the data for the figure and embeds it. So I just want to explain this because you have both options of, of using the, the, the rendering figures, and they both have their uses. So it's important that you know, that you know how to use both. OK? So yes? If you do WX afterwards or AGG instead of just PyLab, instead of just PyLab the percent PyLab, then you, I, that worked on, on my Mac. The, yeah. But just PyLab by itself didn't work. Oh, really? Yeah. I had to tell it the back engine. I had to tell it which back engine to use. So I had a space WX there, and that's what I needed. To OK. Work. And that's because it'll, it defaults to not a floating one, but whatever is in your uh, map no, 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 no. Yes. So when you, if you, so the question was how to get the floating, the floating windows, and depending on how your Matplotlib is configured, just typing PyLab might actually not default to the floating window one, depending on how you have your configuration. So you can explicitly ask by saying PyLab WX to get a WX backend, or PyLab QT. I would do QT because that's the one I use by default. On the Mac, there actually is a Mac. There is a native Mac backend called OSX. I can't type that. This is not a Mac. But those of you on Macs, you can type PyLab OSX, and you will get the native Mac uh, backend, which I think works very nicely. OK. so. What if you've been using, right now, as I said, there's no way to toggle between the two at runtime. But you can toggle without having to completely kill your notebook. The reason is that you can restart a notebook kernel, and this will kill the Python process and open a fresh new one, which has no PyLab yet. So if I restart my kernel, which obviously deletes all my variables and closes all my windows, then I can rerun it again, and now the next time I can do, I can make a different choice of PyLab. So from now on, unless I need floating windows, I'm going to do inline just because it's easy. So unless I'm demonstrating something specific to floating windows, I'm going to use inline windows because they're a little bit easier for, for demonstration purposes. So the first example showed a very, very simple plot. And the reason why we, I wanted to look at this example after having explained the whole business with floating and inline windows is that this is how many of you probably so far have seen how to use matplotlib. You have some data in X and Y, you make a plot, you give it a legend, you give it a title, you give it some labels, and you make all these calls using plt.whatever. You're not creating figures by hand. Maybe at most you're making, I made a figure here manually, but this would have worked actually even without that first call. And later, I can add a line to that plot. Basically, I keep making plot commands, and they just keep getting added. This API is very familiar to anyone coming from a MATLAB background. How many of you have used MATLAB in the past? OK, roughly half the class. So this is modeled straight up after MATLAB. It's very, it's, so it's going to be very familiar for those of you who come from a MATLAB background. But effectively, what it uses is a very, very stateful entity that is keeping track of the concept of, I know what my active figure is. All the commands go to my active figure. If you want to do something in a different figure, you have to make that figure the active figure. It's not a very good way of writing robust code because it means that things depend on the order in which you execute them a lot. If you, if you make the active figure the wrong one and you, put, you move this piece of code over here, now things go to the wrong figure. So matplotlib actually has a different way of building objects, which is only slightly, takes only a small amount more code than this, and I find to be my preferred form of working by and large because it's much more maintainable and leads to cleaner code in the long run. So this is fine for quick and dirty stuff. You want to just open a data file or you have, some, you have a function that you want to plug quickly to look at it, this is perfectly OK. But the object-oriented API, now I'm going to do the exact same two plots with the other interface. So this object-oriented API, 
I, I make a figure and what's called an axis object. And instead of calling figure, I call a command called subplots. So the subplots command, the subplots command, So the subplots, the subplots command. Uh, let me open it here again. Not just that he's proud of subplots. Yeah. Okay. I usually give Fernando a hard time because he wrote subplots. But. Well, because it was annoying to use beforehand. So what the subplots command does is it lets you create a grid of n by m subfigures, and it returns both the figure and what's called the axis. And why do you want the axis? It, now we have to understand how Matplotlib is structured a little bit, and that was the whole point of this lecture. Um, if I stand on, if I sit on the parentheses for, for like 100 milliseconds, or I think it's, I don't remember what the threshold is, for a little bit under a second, then eventually it pops up. Yeah, in master, tab is broken, so I couldn't press tab. But yes, no, if you press tab, it'll also come. Tab at a parentheses will, will bring up the call tip. Unfortunately, in master, tab is broken right now, so I can't use it. So in matplotlib, when you make a new figure, you get what's called a figure object. Okay? You get a figure object, and then, but the figure is not actually the thing that makes plots. The figure is just a container for plots. Plots are made by what are called axis objects. So matplotlib, if you want to plot, the figure itself doesn't know how to plot. It has no axes on its own. You have to add a set of axes. This is how the library was designed. And this an axis object, this is the guy who knows how to make plots. An axis object has methods to make log plots, semi-log plots, error bar plots, logarith um, scatter plots, polar plots. And you can create axes of many different kinds. So if you want to make a grid of plots, say a three by, you want to make three plots, you can do this would have three axis objects. And so you could call this axis 1, axis 2, and axis 3. And with these variables, now each of these entities is capable of doing, of doing its plot. So ax3 dot plot, blah, 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 will plot something in here. So the top level plt dot plot command that we used before, plt dot plot is shorthand for make me a figure make me an axis and call plot on that axis all in one shot. Very convenient for one-off things, but not very fine control if you need to really specify where you want things to go, okay? So the subplots command, what it does is it returns, you can have an n by m grid of plots, and it gives, it, it gives you both the figure container and each of the individual axes, and you can grab them one at a time, or you can grab all of them as, an, as a NumPy array of objects so that you can then say axis 0, 0,3, for example, and call plot on that. And the reason you may want to do that is because if you're writing complicated code where you're creating a 4 by 4 panel for statistical analysis of plots, for example, and then you want to iterate, and you're, you're, now you're writing code algor basically algorithmically, where you're moving over a grid of plots to access pieces of your data, you don't want to be doing that by manually counting things. You want to be able to index that array of plots with, with actual variables. And what it, what it will return is precisely the figure in the, the plots on the inside. So what is the difference between, between how you access plot and how you access, how you do things with the axis versus how you do them globally? So before we had done, let me delete this cell. So before we had done this, plot, legend, title, X label, Y label, that's it. Now the syntax is a little bit different because now the syntax has to do those things on the specific, things like the titles and the labels are done with set commands. Why? Well, that's how the code was written. I probably would have written it slightly differently, but so be it. So now I've made, if I simply call subplots with one, with no arguments, the default is a one by one grid so that it's as similar to just calling figure as before, you get the figure and you get a single axis. On that axis, you can call plot, you can call legend. And then if you want the same thing, title, you have to say set title. So you have to say set title harmonic, 
set x label and set y label. Now here, if I make a new figure and a new plot, the advantage of this is that I now have a handle on both the first axis and the second axis. So AX is the first axis, AX1 is my second axis. So I can go back and plot cosine on my first figure with even if this code is later in the code. Before, I had to be very careful up here in that I did everything for the first figure and then I'm done. Because the moment I make a figure, anything that I type here goes to the second figure. And there's a way of manually toggling back and forth, but it's, it's, it's a state machine. So it's going to, it has a notion of who I'm sending these things to, and if you get it wrong, things end up in the wrong place. Here, you have explicit control. You have your first axis, you have your second axis, and you can tell later on, you can say, I want on my first axis also cosine. And when I run this code, I get this. I end up with my sine and my cosine up here, and I end up with, now, Observe, the legend only shows sign here, and that's because I added this after I made my legend on my first axis. So if I want, and that's because the le legend, at, when the legend was constructed, it, the plot only had the sign line, if you want. So it doesn't mean that there's no sense of order in these things, but at least you, you, you can control where things go. Any questions? Paul. True. So you can do set underscore tab and then Very that's completely opaque with the TLT True. And and to let's illustrate that point. If you do set and tab complete, at least you see as Paul was saying, all these are all the things that you can actually set. So it's it makes for a much more discoverable interface because you type set underscore and then you can kind of look at that list and fi figure out what it is that, that you need to do. <coughs> Any other questions? Okay. So the subplots command is equivalent if you find yourself in a, in a, on a system that is old, very old, it, you might not have the subplots command. You can use, you can make the figure manually, and then you can start calling add subplot with a funky syntax that is copied from MATLAB, which is an integer, or you can use comma, you can comma separate it too, but this syntax 111 means one plot total, first row, first, first column. So if you're going to make a, a two by three grid, you would say 611, 612, 613. So you see a lot of code written doing basically index arithmetic to get this mess right. And it's very easy to get it wrong. But that's the syntax. And you have to add them one by one. So under the hood, subplots is doing all that logic for you. So we get it, we get it right once, and then we reuse it. But it's important to know that that exists in case you need it. So this. As I said, is the simplest case, but you can actually very equally easily say, I need a one by two grid of plots. And you can, exp so now what comes back is going to have two axes, and you can immediately, if it's only a couple, you can name those axes as variables immediately by using this syntax. Python allows you to name things explicitly in this manner. So if you say subplots one, two, you know that the first thing you get is always the figure. And then you're going to get a one by two array. You can un this is called tuple unpacking. You can unpack, and this is going to be the first element and the second element, and you name them right away, which is convenient when you only have two or three. Using the indexing array syntax is necessary if you, if, if you have a complex grid. You're not going to do x1, x2, x3, x, a bunch of variables, right? But if you only have one or two or maybe three, it's actually handy to have just standalone names for them. Choose whatever works best for you. Now, what about this? share y argument. So for that, I need to switch gears again. I'm going to restart my kernel because I need to switch gears into, this is something that only makes sense in floating windows. So if I say share y equals true, what does that mean? So this is a simple plot, but this is one where I said 1 by 2, share y. What share y means is that the y-axis of these two plots is actually shared. They're linked. And so the advantage of that is that if I decide 
to zoom in this part of my data, the other one also zooms. If I decide to pan in the horizontal direction, they're not linked. The x-axis are not linked. But if I pan in the vertical direction, they're linked. If I zoom in the vertical direction, the two axes are linked. So if you're analyzing data and you have quantities that are related to each other, you can decide. Maybe they're in different units, so the y-axis don't make sense to be shared, but there are a bunch of time series com computed computed at the same time from the same phenomenon, you want the x-axis to be shared, so you zoom in one, and all of your time zero is zoom, zoom, zoom together to the same spot. That's what you can do with share x and share y. Question? Could you do it with, if there was some linear relationship where you're scaling the units, actually have the units scale? No, I don't know that there's an automatic transformation for rescaling, for rescale, share and, and sort of rescale on the fly. So the, the question was, could you do this kind of axis sharing <coughs> But if, if there is uh, something like a unit transformation or a relationship between the two, and so you want to inject a transform as you do the changing, I believe the answer is no. But, yeah, Stefan. So one thing you can do is to uh, change the format. Uh, so you can change the way the ticks are rendered. And then so you have the same numeric scale on the bottom of, of the x-axis, for example. Mm -hmm. But then you decide what each tick means on each plot. True. So you can have dates on the one and the Good point. Yes, that's, that, that, that's a trick. So the answer that Stefan gave was you could have two different axes that share, say, the, the x-axis, but where, where each one of them has a different tick formatter. It turns out that in matplotlib, the things that put these ticks, most of the time you just let them be. They come out whatever it is based on your data. But you actually have very fine control over who puts ticks in here. And there are examples in the matplotlib gallery about how to do that. So you could specify two axes that are sharing, but that are using different tick formatters, and the tick formatters apply the transformation that you need. I've never actually tried it, but that's a good idea. Yeah, I mean, effectively what you have to do is transform your data in, in one plot to match you know, the range that you want on the other one, and then you let them share, but then you, you show some, some sort of transformation on that data, so you undo that transformation. That's yeah. kind of fluky. Yeah, it, yeah but it works. Uh, For your uh, final project, you could submit to MathPlotlib. Uh, that support for that. that yeah. yeah. That's uh, often people will do, for example, log plots in that way. Instead of instead of transforming the data, they basically just they do a normal plot but they, they only change their tick. So it it works. What Question. Would the, uh, axis name look like for two by two? If you want to unpack it manually, so l let's do a couple of examples. Let me show you. So the question was, what would the, two, the axis tuple for 2 by 2 look like? So let me first not do the tuple, first to show you what it is. If I simply say sub, subplots, subplots, and I say 2 by 2, and I don't unpack, I just grab ax, I want to show you what it is first of all, OK? So I get a 2 by 2, and what is, and so ax, is what I get is an array. I get a two by two array of axes objects. Okay, so I can grab ax. If I ask for what is its shape, it's a numpy two by two array. I can access ax zero comma one, and I can say plot rand a hundred random numbers on that one. And if we look at the figure, oh, this is important. Why didn't anything happen? So when you're doing floating windows, if you call a method on it it doesn't update the figure right away. You have, in this case, you have to manually say draw. OK? Why? The reason is because the object-oriented interface is meant to accumulate commands and not render them until you say so for performance reasons. Because otherwise, the actual action of drawing is expensive. And so if you're up building some very complicated figure in a loop where you're doing lots and lots of things, you don't want to wait on each little subcommand for matplotlib to re-render the whole figure. It would take forever. So when you're using the low-level interface, matplotlib will not draw until you tell it to. If you're using the, the, mat, the, the notebook inline plots, what happens is we have to draw to send the figure. So it, it seems to work the same. But when you're using the floating windows, you see this fact that it, you have to manually tell it draw before drawing actually you happens. Say something about uh, the scope of draw? Because maybe you want to only render the top right. Uh, actually, the top right panel. yeah, I don't know how to control that. I don't either. Uh, I, th I don't. 
So, so draw is, is everything I in the think, current figure. I think draw is everything in the current figure. Paul, do you know if it's any different? I think that's right. So the, the question was, is it possible to control the scope of the draw so that the draw only applies to a specific, well. So that's my final point. Okay. Maybe the X, um, X object has a redraw reflux. Well, we can ask. OK, here. We ask, whenever you have a question like this in, in Python, you ask IPython, show me the code. And so you type draw double question mark, and you see the code. This is the code for draw. And it turns out that it actually does get the whole canvas. So it applies draw on the entire canvas. There is no such thing as partial draws, it seems like. Maybe there's some low level. With these questions, if you actually talk to John or one of those guys, there's always some low level weird way of doing what you have in mind. True. So, but, but that's yeah, it's kind of a different route. Yeah. So, so, so between draw and show? So I guess I've seen other examples where they always do show. Yes. So show, the difference is draw is meant to update a figure. Show is a harder command, a more expensive command that is meant to also bring windows to the forefront and possibly create windows if they didn't exist. So for example, show is the command that you put at the end of a script. If you write a standalone script that is meant not to run in IPython, but just at the command line as a normal script, at the very end, if you don't put a show at the very end, all the figures that you created never will pop up as windows. So show basically does drawing, but does even more than drawing. It does window management. Draw doesn't do window management. I already had created, the, the window was already there. All I was doing was updating the data in one of the panels. Okay. So this was a roundabout way to answer your question, because first I wanted to show you what you got in this case. Now the question is, can I grab these guys all by themselves? I believe you can, but I'm not sure. I think you can do this. Yes, you can. So the question was, how can I unpack these four axes? Well, it's two by two, so if you write a nested structure which is, has a two by two nesting, then Python will correctly unpack those four elements in a two by two uh, unpacking. At that point, I probably would just use ax and index with indices. This is probably the limit. I tend to use the unpacking when I have two or three. You, you can't unpack by row-wise, right, as well? True. If you do only this, because a numpy, a two by two array, is a two array, has rows first. If you do this, this also works. And in this case, axe one is the first row of arrays of plots, and axe two is the second row of subplots. Okay? This is just how Python works. This is nothing specific to Matplotlib. Okay? Now, if you have a really obnoxiously complicated case, I think, for, uh, let me see if I, ha if I need, yeah, let me restart my kernel so that I'm back to plotting. If you have an obnoxiously complicated layout need, you can use subplot to grid, which is a more complicated command. I won't go into the full details of it, but this is a command, this is a little example that allows you to do things like this. You cannot do this with subplots. Okay, subplots is only m by n, that's it. Rows and columns, as many as you want, but that's it. This kind of overlapping grids, uh, you have to use the subplot to grid. And there is something even worse called the Axis Grid Toolkit, which allows you to do really, really exotic and complex grid layouts with plots. So with matplotlib, the answer to how do I do something in matplotlib is very rarely you can't. It's mostly a matter of how much time are you willing to put into it. But there are tools to do really, really esoteric things with it. I don't actually know how to use the Axis Grid Toolkit. It's I, I've never needed to do something as exotic as what, what, uh, what it does. But while we're on the subject, so the one thing that you all, and I showed this uh, at the boot camp, but I'm going to briefly show it again for the benefit of those of you who are not at the boot camp. The first thing you do when you're trying to do something in MATLAB is you go to the gallery. The gallery is a page that is full of thumbnails of all kinds of stuff in matplotlib, and you, you browse through the gallery, and you visually scan the thing that looks closest to what, whatever it is that you're trying to do. And you click on that, so if you're trying to do something with 
for example, contours and images and color bars. Okay, that looks like a good starting point. So you click on that. And then what you get is a bigger version of the figure. You can actually get high resolution versions of it. But more importantly, you get all of the source code that does that. Okay? And so, but you don't even have to copy and paste. You can copy the link of the source code and in your notebook, let's go back to where I was, in your notebook you can type the command, a command, a Py, an IPython command called loadpy and if you give it the URL of that path, IPython will fetch, fetch the script from the internet and put it in the next cell so that you can just go ahead and run it. So it's a very easy way to find something that you need grab it, view it, see that it does the same thing. So indeed this does the same thing that the gallery was showing. Okay, yeah, it's pretty much the same figure, more or less. And so now you can begin changing it and tweaking it to, until you get what you need, okay? So loadpy is very useful. The loadpy command, what it does is it grabs either a local file, you can give it a path on your disk, or a URL, fetches the data, and puts it into, your, into the next cell so that you can begin playing with it. Okay. So this is about as much as I'm going to show you about sub subplot to grid and complicated layouts. Beyond here, go to the gallery, right? I mean, at, at this point, you go to the gallery and you look for the examples. The gallery is an unstructured view of the entire set of examples. If you want them cate categorized, the same examples are here sorted by, by topic. So you can also see them sorted by topic and by name. And some, sometimes this, this may be easier, uh, an easier way to find the one you're after than visually. So, but Mat Matplotlib has lots of examples. Unfortunately, they're not all as well commented as they should. But it does have a lot of examples. Well, and the other thing to recognize is that they're all, uh, some of them are kind of the stateful way where they're just trying to show you like how you histogram. And they're not saying big one. And they're not yes. saving an axis. They're just doing, so I, I actually find the galleries pretty confusing for learning how to sort of uh, make your own figures in Matplotlib. They're really just to show you how to do that one sort of thing. And, and I, so the, the point that Josh was raising for the webcast is that the, the gallery uses a lot of the very stateful PLT top level commands, which is not really the best way to work when you're trying to build a complicated plot in for a paper or, or, or something more long term. And I think that the gallery is just in big need of, of a big cleanup. There's also a fair amount of, it has kind of overgrown over the years, and so there's a lot, fair amount of redundancy. It's still very useful, and obviously it's better than nothing, but there is a fair amount of redundancy there, and I think it could use with some trimming and fewer examples, but examples that were better explained, that were kind of fewer of them with more explanation and detail would go a long way. There's been a little bit of whoever sends an example goes in, uh, and then over the years you just end up with, with a fair amount of, and many, some of them unfortunately have even no comments at all. So, okay, there's a bunch of code, not a single comment, and a figure. Well, that's actually not always the most useful thing. But still, even with these caveats, it is a very useful resource, and I still do use it a lot. Okay, so, how are we doing on time, Paul? We have this, we're gonna, we're gonna finish this yeah, one. Okay, no, no, but, but we do, we do want to do that. And I, I'm not doing all of this notebook because th this had some old materials that was redundant with yours. I ported it so, so I would have it. But, um, so how do you control now properties? So for example, if you want, the, the, many, many common properties can be set directly by, uh, in your normal call. So for example, if you want a dashed red line, you say line style equals dash dash, color equals R. Those of you who come from MATLAB again will find the syntax familiar. The plot documentation explains what all of the valid styles and colors are, um, and, it, and uh, it works this way. But if you grab the line object, just as much as we saw how the axis object had all of these set X label and set Y label and so on and so forth, the line objects that, that you get also, so in here, when we plotted this, the output was this, was a list with a single matplotlib dot lines line 2D object. Well, that line object is the object that is this red line right here. So you can actually get a hold of the line object and later manipulate it. So if I do, if I grab the line object, so this, this syntax simply means get the list and unpack it. It's a single element list, so I unpack it in one shot. And then I type, I type 
tab in here. I've just copied and pasted so you would see all of the tab completion in one shot. These are all the things that you can set about a line. So you can set its colors. You can set the data that it represents. You can set many, many, many things on it. I don't know what many of them are, but, but, but some of them are fairly obvious and fairly useful, such as color. The data, the data ones are, uh, the set data is very useful because this, this is the actual array of numbers that the line has. So if you need to update a plot without redrawing the whole plot, as, as Josh was asking earlier, what you do is what, what Paul pointed out. You don't try to focus the draw operation, which is global. What you do is you grab the object and you reset the data on that object. And so every time you draw, only that object will have changed. And so set data is one of these properties. You can set the dashing. So what I would recommend, uh, the only reason why I want to tell you this is so that you know this way of working exists. And when you need to do something with fine detail, you can begin to, to uh, manipulate it. And finally, Matplotlib also has a command called set p. I want to mention it in case you see it in tutorials. I typically just operate in this way. But you can also, you can also say set property and on the line, you can call line style. The advantage of set p is that if you simply call it, it prints back what the possible values are. So here, you have to look at the doc string, whereas here, it will tell you, oh, these are all the things you can set. So if you say set p on line, it will print. These are all the things you can set, and these are all the values you can use. So basically, it's a way of discovering, OK, I, I need to change this. What can I change on this thing? Set p on that object, and it'll print out, OK, these are all the things you can change here. And set p can manipulate multiple lines at a time. So for example, you want to change the thickness of every line in your plot all in one shot. So this is an example where I've made a plot with two different lines. I made x1, y1, and x2, x, y2. So one of them is sine of x, one another one is sine of 2x. And then if I later simply say set p on lines, and I change the, the line width and the color, then this automatically applies the transformation to all of the lines in one single shot. So this is a little bit of the machinery. And you can call, just like line has, line has, as we saw, a bunch of things you can set, it also has a generic just set, which allows you to set basically all of those in a single call. So set line width and color and line style and so on and so forth. You can do all those in a single shot. So as you can see, you have very fine control. It's not just that the top level call has to be the end of what you do. So in simple plots, this is what matplotlib will return, line objects. And line objects. As we saw, you can, you can manipulate. Oh, and here I had an example. So here's a good example of changing the data, the, changing the data on a line. So now, once you change the data, if you replot, so here what we're doing is we're making a plot, and initially, initially the plot had, initially the plot had only one, two, and three. But later, I'm changing the range to be from 0 to 1. And if I reset the data to be now this data from 0 to 1, the original range will not be correct. So now I have to manually tell it to set the limits on the axis. And we can do that manually, or we can ask it, we can grab the axis object and ask it to, to do it automatically. And then, as we said before, we have to draw. We have to draw things. We we have to do the drawing, the drawing manually. So, this is the kind of thing that you end up having to do if you need to set, if you're doing, if you're manipulating the structure of your plot by hand, which does end up being necessary when you're doing things like uh, like animation, for example. Then you have you have to basically now get a little bit dirtier because all of the automatic machinery that tries to guess for you is not available anymore. Now, the other component, as I said before, is the axis, which we saw here. And then finally, you have the figure object, which is 
the container of all of them. And the figure, these things are intertwined. So the figure object has a member called axes, which is the actual list of all the axes that it has. So if we make, for example, if I make a figure and I print what are, its, what are its axes, I get an empty list. So the figure always has the, the list of axes that, that, that it contains. If I do f dot x equals subplots two by two, here I get my figure with two by two plots, but the, the figure axis is just the naked list of the actual axis instances. So you can always get you can always get these things. We actually debated when we made subplots whether to only return the figure since you can get the axes. But because it's a little bit awkward and because of the, the, the desire to have 2D indexing, we decided to actually return both. And similarly, yes? Why you put the axis of um, Because it was written as a list. Basically, when, when they first wrote matplotlib, the axis was made a list that just gets a new axes appended. It's also oh. because you, can, you don't have to use, as we saw in the axes grid example, they don't necessarily have to be a grid. True. True. That, yeah, that's actually the right answer. So the question was for the webcast: Why is why is the why is this not an array but a list? And really, the answer is what Paul said: You can have a figure, and you can have an axis here, an axis here, an axis here that overlaps if you want. You can have axes that have an arbitrary geometry. When you create new axes, you can tell the coordinates of the axis wherever you want. So it doesn't necessarily fit a model of a two-dimensional index. For subplots, it has to because we made subplots be m by n. It's restricted to that case. Yes, but internally, dot axes, dot axes is the internal matplotlib storage, which has to accommodate all cases. Yeah, you can append to this list another axis that you create in, by some other means. After the and fact. Then, and then redraw. And then those axes know where they want to be put on the screen. We can put an axis on top here in the middle of these four, and Matplotlib will be perfectly happy doing that, which is, in fact, how you do inset plots, which is a very common thing. You have something, you're drawing some data here, and you want an inset plot here. You have an, a big axis, and then you put a little axis here, and the inset plot, plot shows some other property. That's perfectly OK. So one of the things to recognize is that you can delete axes, right, just as if you're popping items out of a list. You can also remove lines. Because lines that are part of axes um, are just objects, and you can get rid of those. Another thing which you'll need for the, the homework is to know something called um, set visible. So you can actually set the lines to be visible or not. So you don't have to actually kill all the data and actually kill the line. Like if you wanted to show something on and off, um, you could actually just keep toggling the set visible. So this is an example of set, set visible. So in here, we made this funky grid in the call to subplot to grid, but we don't want tick marks on all of these things. Imagine how ugly that would look if there were tick numbers everywhere. So what we did is we made, we made this, complicate, this call to subplot to grid to create the whole layout. And then we walk. So this is an example where we're walking the list of axes. And then we're saying for t in all of the tick labels in x plus all of the tick labels in y. So I want all the tick labels x and y of each axis. I want to call set visible to false. And that is exactly what Josh was saying. It turns the visibility of that object to 0. And then matplotlib simply, matplotlib, as it's drawing, it checks anything it's about to draw. It has a visibility flag. And if it's false, it doesn't draw it. So this allows you to turn things, make things visible and, not, and invisible on the fly, which also means that you can actually make interactive figures, as uh, um, Paul is going to show a little bit later, with event handling, where if you click on something, data becomes visible and invisible. So you can overlay data, turn it on and off without deleting it. You don't have to re-render. You simply re change its visibility. And so now that we've sort of seen here, there is an example that, ha that is mostly for you guys to study so that you see sort of a common, slightly non-trivial plot. And later, we're going to see a much more complicated one, but a common non-trivial plot where you have a few lines. You want a thick horizontal axis. You want a thick vertical axis. You also want a grid at the tick marks. And you want a, and you want a legend. And you want a title and labels. This is an example that does it 
that does it all in a sort of a, re a reasonably common type of plot where you say I'm, I'm plotting three data sets and I want them all to have a certain thickness. I also want a grid and I also want a legend and I want my legend in the lower right and I also want two thick axis lines, one horizontal and one vertical to represent my x and y axes and then I want to set my label. So this is, this is kind of a, something that is a little bit beyond the simple plot command and it's, it's fairly common of a reasonably realistic data plot that you would say put in a paper or a poster for a conference or something. So having understood, this is how all plots in matplotlib are structured. This notion of figures that contain axes and axes that contain lines and polygon patches and other internal geometric primitives. This is how matplotlib achieves all of its plotting. So what are some of, now I, I want to quickly show you some common plots that you may actually need to use in practice. For example, an error plot. How do you make an error plot? And in this case, I made it just with the standard the standard, the, the, the top level syntax. Keep in mind, these are always, the actual drawing is always done via the axis. So just as I made this in here, I could have made my usual f.aax, and then these would be ax.errorbar, ax.setTitle. So error, in error bar, you can specify the values of the error bars in x and y explicitly, or you can pass arrays with the actual values if the error bars in your data are different. So, Making an error plot is very straightforward in matplotlib. This is one slightly more complicated example where you want to do something like that. You want, whoops, I'm not going to go through every line. These, the, you have these notebooks. These are for, for your benefit. What, what we were trying to do is to give you a set of examples that was a little bit easier to navigate than the gallery for kind of common, commonly useful things, okay? So this is an example where you have uh, error bars that are different for every point and in some cases you only have error bars in the x or y direction and in this particular case you also want them do you want this to be a log plot and you want the error bars to be in a different color so for example in here the error bars are in a different color they're green which is different from the color of the lines themselves you can study the calls the idea is for you guys to play play with this you can make this is an example of making two plots in, a, in the same figure, one with a normal linear axis, but the other one to be a semi-log plot with a, a semi-log y plot, which is the x-axis is linear, the y-axis is a logarithmic axis. So by now we're used to this. We do two by one, so two by one means two rows, one column, and I call plot on the first one, and I call semi-log y on the second, and that's it. I have, I have my semi-log plot in my bottom axis. By the way, something that I want to show you, let me just make this in a new. Oops. So two other things that are useful to know about the floating windows. These grids that you were seeing Oh, okay. If you say G, the grid pops on and off. So the same thing as toggling the grid with a function call can be made interactively. And if you type L, you will change into a logarithmic axis, whichever axis is closest to the pointer. So this will toggle the vertical axis to be a log axis, and this will make, uh, or. I think they changed it, whatever is next to L, KT or something is the other one. Ah, okay, they changed that. Okay, they changed that and they didn't ask us for permission. So, no, yes, it's K. So, it's, so L is the Y axis becomes log and K is the X axis becomes log. Do you have a question back? No. Oh, okay. Um, so these are things that are, th th these are handy to know when you're working interactively, especially, with, for example, if you're plotting numerical error in, a, in, in an approximation and you want to see it, often you want to see the error both in a linear plot and in a log plot f to look at numbers of digits of precision, for example. You can do, I do this a lot, or toggling the grid. So this is obviously something that in your, if you want these, these in, um, in, in inline plots, you have to explicitly request semi -log, your plots to be log. So when are you going to make the inline plots more interactive? You said that was something you guys wanted to do. No, so there's, there's, the question is, when are we going to make the inline plots more interactive? There's two answers to that question. The easy one is we're going to allow toggling between interactive and, and, uh, between interactive and floating. That's relatively straightforward. We, I even had the patch working a while ago. It just has bit rotted. It's a matter of, that's an afternoon's worth of work. 
the harder but obviously much more interesting question is when are we going to make these plots themselves be interactive? That is what everybody wants. It's not trivial at all to accomplish. Because, and we are looking into how to do it. There are JavaScript libraries that are capable of doing pretty good rendering. The question is how to hook up the Matplotlib backend with JavaScript. Um, this weekend, somebody showed me. Yes. What's that? Well, the, we, we've also looked at, so the HTML5 backend is a project actually from South Africa, from some colleagues of Stefan, um, from the Square Kilometer Array uh, in South Africa. And um, Stefan, maybe you can update us a little bit on that. You, you met with them this over Christmas, right? Yeah. So what was the question? Oh, the, the, the status of the HTML5 backend. So yeah, the, the, the problem is that they have their own web server. So the HTML5 backend basically spins up a web server whose only job is to produce plots. And so it has its own port. It, it's an entire separate web service for generating plots. Whereas obviously that, we're not going to have two web servers on the inside of one another. So the architectural design is not quite what we need. But it's possible that we could repurpose some of that. So I suspect what's going to happen is things are probably going to go in several directions at the same time. The JavaScript, excuse me, the JavaScript solution I think is going to get done pretty quickly. This weekend somebody showed me, unfortunately in, in private, it's, it's not something which is available to the public, it's a development at a company. They showed me they have wired up pieces of the IPython notebook with one of the modern JavaScript visualization libraries that are out there. And, and they're beginning to develop a prototype on that. So, and these people did it over the course of a couple weekends I think using our code. So that, I think, is going to get done fairly soon. The problem with that is that you get a few simple plots. You don't get the full Matplotlib machinery. Ultimately, what we want is something where Matplotlib itself can send data to a JavaScript front end, which renders nicely in the browsers. You can pan, you can zoom. But whenever you need new data from Matplotlib, it can call back into, into Python. And that is the long-term project. If anybody here likes JavaScript webby stuff and wants to talk to us, this is a really, really, really interesting project. But it's not trivial. It's not a trivial amount of work. Does that answer your question? Oh, yeah. Okay. The answer to a question like that is always, it'll be faster if you help us. Yes. Yeah. If you roll your sleeves up, we will get done quicker. So here's a, a, more, a more complex plot showing, showing um, more complicated log plots that we don't need to go too deep into. Bar plots are another type of plot that is fairly common. A lot of people need to do bar plots with error bars. This is fairly common in many fields. So here's a quick example that summarizes how to do how to do a bar plot that has error bars on all the data and the error bars themselves are of different colors for each individual su subgroup that you have. Nothing particularly difficult about it. Um, this one I want you to concentrate on because I'm about to stop speaking and give you a problem. So actually wake up and pay attention for a second. Um, so here I'm plotting, I'm using a different kind of plot which is called a scatter plot. So you can plot, I can make a plot with uh, This is a plot of 100 random numbers using circle O, using circular markers. This is made using the plot call. But Matplotlib has a different type of plot called a scatter plot, which is the scatter call. And the difference between plot with circles and scatter is that in scatter, each individual circle can be controlled. When you do plot with circles, you're simply saying, you can choose the color, but it's all of them. You can choose the size, but it's for all of them. It's, they're all the same. Whereas in scatter, you individually have control both over the size and the color of your individual markers. So this is useful for representing data. And you can, in this case, it's with circles, but you can choose the circle, the, the, you can choose the polygon that, that you, the marker that you put in here. And the argument to scatter are the x and y axes, as always, the x and y data. But the next argument, s, is the size of that point. If you give a constant, they're all the same size. But if you give an array, then that's the size in area. Keep in mind, this is the area. So it's the area in pixels of that. It's an estimate of the area of that marker. And you can also give it a different, you can give it a color map. So you can actually encode with color in your data some other variable. So now I want you guys to spend 15 minutes or so doing a small breakout problem. 
where the breakout problem is, imagine that you have data that has this format. This is real data. It's the there's a file called stations.txt in the data directory that you downloaded. And the data contains four letter codes. And then it contains three numbers, latitude, longitude, and elevation. And what we want you to do is, first of all, two things. And there, there will be a later, a later part with, uh, with event handling. Make a scatter plot of these where both you encode the elevation with both color and the size of the marker. Then add a color bar on the right that shows the color elevation map. And also label each station by its four letter code. So that when you see a map, you have, you have the four letter code. And if you have the base map, matplotlib toolkit installed, whoops. If you have the base map toolkit, which uh, I don't know if EPD includes. Can somebody try typing the following? Import base map. Uh, no, I, not, no, it's not that. It's from MPL. From MPL toolkits import base map. Does that work on EPD or not? I don't know if they ship. It does? OK, so you guys all have the base map toolkit. Then in addition to the basic plot, do another one that actually uses latitude and longitude. And you're going to have to look up a little bit about base map to finish this. Um, and uh, that also uses the, the, the base map toolkit to actually draw proper latitude and longitude grids, draw rivers and country boundaries in this region of the Earth, and put the, the satellite image of the Earth as a background. So it's actually fairly straightforward. And you have, well, 15 minutes. Let's see, how, let's see how far you get. I mean, the whole point of these is that there's a little bit more work than you can actually finish. But give it a try for 15 minutes. Ask us if you have any questions. And I'm going to put up what the results look like to give you, uh, where's, my, where's my dashboard? Oh, here it is. Mapping seismic stations. So this is what the basic plot should look like. We're encoding both the elevation. The elevation is represented both in the size of the circle and in the color. This is the elevation in kilometers. And these are the labels of each of those stations. And this turns out to actually be a part of the Himalayas. So if you use base map, you get the same thing. But now this is on top of, 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 an Im of the NASA blue marble image. So you can actually see these are the, this is the snow. These are the snows on the Himalayas. This is Tibet up here. And this is Nepal down here. And you have the rivers in Xi'an and the country boundaries in yellow. So this is actually not, not too much code. I mean, it's, that's it. That's the code that does this. It's 15 lines of code. And you get, you get a very decent, realistic looking plot. So give it a try. You also have the solution. But try to at least, you may not be able to get all of this working though you could cheat a little bit, they're actually just very simple calls. At the very least, you should be able to get this one done because you have the data sitting on your system. And if you get stuck, raise your hand, I'll come over, and we'll give it 15 minutes.
Yeah. All the way to green. So, did anyone get did anyone get the um, the actual uh, Earth image to come up? Not quite. Okay. So let's have a look at the the first solution. So the, the first solution was really basically one line of two lines of code. Um, so okay, no. First we had to load the data. So let me back, backtrack a little bit. So you guys all have the mapping seismic um, notebook. So I load everything. Oops. So let me start in line. I load NumPy and Matplotlib. So I'm going to define my D-type as, as we saw as the, at the beginning. I'm going to have stations, latitude, longitude, and elevation. And this is the syntax that I showed you, where you, say, you define a dict with names and formats. You can also define it in this way, a list of pairs. Either of, they're completely equivalent. There's actually more syntaxes in that document that I told you. And then once you have that, you can say load txt, which is the numpy, just like I made zeros with a d-type, you can load with a d-type. So if you call the load txt numpy routine that reads data from a text file and you give it that d-type, which we, we just made, then we load our data file. And as, as Josh had said, we make it a rec array for con just for the convenience of being able to type dot lat dot lon. So at first I'm printing in here, so we load the data, and at first I'm printing just, just a few simple things. For example, if I print tab.station, tab is my table. So tab.station, it prints these are all my station names. These are all my elevations. The first station is tab 0, which is Bira at these coordinates and 120 meters basically at sea level. The mean latitude, the, each one of these things is a NumPy array. So you can ask, what is the mean latitude of all these things? Well, just call dot mean on that array, and you get the mean latitude. So this is just to show you how quickly you can summarize your data once you have it loaded in this rec array form. But now the meat of the exercise, which was the plot. So we make a subplot. I made it a little bit bigger. And, uh, and now I simply say, on my axis, I call scatter. Longitude goes first on the x-axis, latitude on the y-axis. The, for the sizes, we want to encode the elevation. And I just played with numbers until I found a number that was roughly good. I basically multiplied the elevations by 40 and added 1, so we, we, I wouldn't have num very small numbers at, at 0. This is purely for visual purposes. Um, and then for color, C allows me to, to give it the color. I, um, I use the elevation. Then I want a color bar. So the color bar is an attribute of the figure because a color bar is actually a special type of axis. The way Matplotlib draws this color bar right here, it's actually making an axis. And in that axis, it's actually painting colors. So it's not an attribute of this axis. It is an attribute of the figure. But you have to tell it what data it's mapping. You have to tell it the color bar, what is it going to represent. So you pass it the output of the scatter call. I don't expect you to have known all of this, but the whole point was to get you trying a little bit, playing with the gallery, finding examples. Uh, we make the title, and then we want to label it. Matplotlib has a any, ax any access object can put text at arbitrary locations with a text method. So we simply, and in this case, I'm, I'm using the bracket syntax, so you see that they both work. So now, for every record in my table, I'm going to put text at the lat longitude and latitude coordinates slightly offset. So I'm not slapping the label on top of the point, but a little bit offset. Um, and then I'm going to make them bold, just so that they are a little bit easier to read. And that gives me this puppy. And now I'm going to repeat effectively the same thing, but now using base map to make a map of the Earth. And as you see, it's actually pretty straightforward. First of all, I want my base map to co contain a part of the Earth that goes a little bit outside the boundaries of just my points, because otherwise base map will draw the box really just on the points. So I made, I found, I found the bounding box by calling min and max on my latitude and longitude, and make it a little bit before and a little bit after. So these are my latitude and longitude boundaries. My geographic grid is going to be, uh, my parallels and my meridians are going to be these. I want to draw a grid with five of them, just so I have something that looks nice. So I can use just lint space. This is a tip that I gave you. When you make base map, you pass a flag called resolution. This is the resolution of the geographic data structures that it contains, things like rivers and, and country boundaries and th stuff like that. The F flag for fine resolution makes this call take forever. On this laptop, I don't know how long it would take. On my desktop at home, which is a very fast machine, it took like a minute to render that map with, with fine resolution. So intermediate is fine. And then this is how base map works. You make a plot, the same thing, and then you create an object called the base map object 
attached to an axis. So what happens is you, may, you have your axis and you say treat it as a geographic map. Base map is a really fancy library that has, knows about all the projections that geographers use out there and it allows you to do transformations between data in geographic coordinates and data in plot coordinates very easily. So this object now, the M base map object, knows about Earth. It knows about Earth within these boundaries at this level of resolution, and it will draw in these axes. So at that point, it's actually really straightforward. You say, draw countries, and you give it a color. Yellow, OK. Draw rivers. Blue marble, and that slaps in the background the, the NASA blue marble image. Um, draw parallels, and you give it the parallels, and you say where, which parts of the map you want labels. Because in, in mapping, people often put labels on, like on all sides of the figure. So you can say which parts of the figure you want labels on. Draw meridians. And then this guy knows how to do scatter. It's like an axis. But look, in here, I'm not calling axis on, I'm not calling scatter on the axis itself. I'm calling scatter on this guy which understands and does all of The reason why you want to do that is because in this case, the figure that we're getting is a square axis, so it doesn't appear to be that big of a deal. But imagine you're representing a big patch of Earth. What happens with a big patch of Earth? What do you need to take into account? Hmm? Curvature. Curvature, exactly, coordinate transformations. There are, and there are many projections, and there are projections that are, that are conformal projections that respect angles but distort areas, and there are equi-area projections that preserve area information at the cost of distorting angles. You can't have both because the sphere has a different topology than, than the plane. So the reason why you call scatter and plot and these things on the method is because it was instantiated with a specific projection, and it will apply the appropriate coordinate transformations so that you pass it data in latitude and longitude, and it knows where it has to go in the right coordinate system in the resulting projection. And uh, that's it. And after that, I made the labels the same as before. But in this case, I, I call them in yellow. And this is an extra flag. There's a couple of extra flags in here that you haven't seen before. One is this Z order. The Z order is the depth on the figure. You can imagine a figure as being made of different things being drawn on top of each other. And sometimes the order in which Matplotlib draws things is not what you want. And you may end up with the rivers covering the dots. And you wanted it the other way around. So by passing the Z order for a specific call, you can control in height. And the higher that, it doesn't matter. The actual values don't really matter. All that they, they define is an order, a stacking of things. So by passing Z order larger, I just make sure that these guys end up on top of the image and the rivers and the country boundaries. And then I also was able to control the transparency. In this case, I said, make these guys slightly opaque. So instead of being Alpha, I mean, alpha is a number between 0 and 1. 0 is fully transparent. You don't see the object. 1 is fully opaque. And anything in between blends it with the background. It allows me to basically see a little bit of the background behind this so I can see the rivers behind these points, but only faintly. So this is only a few lines of code. And this is the kind of plot that you could perfectly well put in an actual paper. And if you save it to a PDF, you have a publication quality plot for, for a paper on a, on a reason. And this is a, a real data set. OK, any questions on this? Yes. It should, it should, um, let me very quickly, I don't want to take, if it doesn't work right away, we'll look at it, um, we'll look at it later. I'm not because I want Paul to have time for his section, but I need to load the data. Okay. Oh, that's interesting. What's that? Oh, size is not defined. That's why. Because size was defined. Where was size defined? Ah, here. OK, so that was that. The title is not defined. Jesus. I did have to run the whole thing. OK, so this one is working fine, the, the one with the, with the, without the map. And now let's run the one with the map.
nope, it's, it's fine. It, so yeah, I, I, there is no reason why it shouldn't. Are you running it from my notebook or yours? It didn't? I think you just try it from the command. Try it from just type by Python in the terminal, uh -huh. and then see if that can get a different yeah. OK, but I, we'll look into it. At the, at the end of the class, I'll come and, and, and have a look. But now I want to leave it for Paul. So here. You don't want to do a histogram? And oh, yes, you're right. Yes, we had a little bit more. So mm -hmm. two other very common types of plots that, that you may need to do. And this here, I'm simply showing you how, what, Hist that not Matplotlib has a built-in histogramming function, which is very handy. You give it the number of bins. You can control w w how, it's, how the histogram is normalized, the what color to put it in. You can, you can, as always, look at the help string. But importantly, what it returns is the actual edges in the bins and the geometric objects that compose the actual rectangles of the patches. So it's kind of an unusual return value, but it's, it's useful to know because you may, for example, especially the bins, you may need to use those for some other things. So you, you, you bin your data, you do your computer histogram, but you often may end up doing other calculations and you want to know the edges of the bins that were used. So this allows you to simply say however many bins you want and you get the actual bin boundaries back so that you don't have to recompute them by hand. And importantly, look at what I did here. Matplotlib has full-blown tech support. So in here, we put at coordinate 60, 0, 25, right here. It's a little faint. I should have made the, the font size a little larger. Mu equals 100, sigma, sigma equals 15. And I'm using dollar signs and backslashes because Matplotlib has full-blown LaTeX support. And it, you don't have to have LaTeX installed. It actually has a LaTeX. Uh, the layout algorithms of tech and the tech fonts are built into Matplotlib. So you can pass any arbitrary math expression to Matplotlib. You enclose it within dollar signs. Uh, whoops, that was me. Um, you enclose it with dollar signs at both ends. And because LaTeX has so many backslashes, you typically want to make that what's called a raw string, which means that backslashes don't require ex additional escapes uh, in Python. And then you can, put, you can put anything that in Matplotlib accepts text accepts LaTeX. Um, all of these commands that, that, accept, uh, that accept text accept LaTeX. So here's one final example that is really straightforward. And the, the only point of it is that you have it for reference here, where it shows the various types of text annotations that you may want to do. So you have this, this is the, what's called the subtitle, the super title at the top for the whole figure. The reason why it's different is because if you have, say, a figure and two axes like this, if you say axis set title, each of these will set its title right here. Whereas the, the figure title is a single one centered at the top of the whole figure. Obviously, with a single axis, they're, kind of, they're almost redundant, but there is a difference. Labels for each, you can put text and you can express text. You can put text either in coordinates relative to the axes, or in meaning between 0 and 1. So they're fixed position on the screen, no matter what the data is doing. Or you can position text in data coordinates, so that if you pan and zoom, the text label moves with the data because it's attached to the data. You can put tech, and, you, and it has the notion of what are called annotations, which have arrow support. And if you look at the gallery, there's all kinds of arrow styles that you can choose, so that you can put text and point an arrow to a specific part on your data. So this example is really mostly for, for your reference. Um, access sharing, we actually covered this at the beginning. And so I'm pretty much done because event handling is going to be covered by Paul with a separate presentation for event handling and fancier plots. And then we'll come back to image, images and Matplot, and a little bit of 3D if we have time for it. Pointer, pointer, mouse, mouse. cool. And that's green. Your, uh, your, your microphone. Oh, yes, it is. Uh, I had my mug somewhere right here. All right, so hey guys, uh, so I'm a little sick um, and a little doped up, so please excuse my slowness. Uh, we're going to start with the. I'm so sick and dope, y'all. You don't even know. Um, 
let's see. I'm so doped up, I don't even remember what I called my um, uh, MPL events. That must be it. OK, so this is, this is going to be short, um, uh, this part of it. So Fernando already stole my thunder. So I'm going to uh, load up this notebook in uh, PyLab mode. Um, and uh, I'm going to show you first. Um, whoa, that's not right. OK, cool. Um, so um, Fernando showed you what some of the buttons that you can press when you have an axis showing. And here I'm showing you all of the buttons you can press. And I just want to uh, put this up here to also point out the fact that you can, um, th this is something called an RC param. OK, and RC params are, uh, there, there are some default values, but you can also set them in your dot matplotlib slash matplotlib RC. So if you just look up what RC params for matplotlib, uh, you can actually set these so that you can change these keys to whatever it is that you like. If you don't like L to be you know, toggling the, uh, the logarithmic thing, you can, you can change that if you like. And we'll look into a little bit how you can add uh, more events. But this is, uh, this is where you would do it. And uh, let me show you now that we have that. Uh, so let me just do a PLT plot. Um, sorry. Range uh, 1 to 10. Uh, so this popped up, I wrote, uh, loaded up PyLab mode, and so now I can, if I press the L key, as Fernando already showed, that this is a logarithmic view of the same. Uh, the K will do it for the x-axis. And uh, so what, what are some of the other ones? The ones that I always use are uh, to O. So I don't like to go up here and use the mouse to just press keys. Uh, uh, oh, press these buttons effectively. So I just press the O button, and that's the equivalent of the zoom. Whoop, sorry. Um, uh, so O is zoom, so now I can do this uh, zoom thing. And so, so I've just zoomed in, and I could go up here and click the back button, but there's actually already a built-in. Uh, backspace will do it, should do it when it works. All right, how about C? OK, so C, and, uh, so C and V allow you to go back and forth. And again, you can set these. Um, so it's the, it's, I'm doing the same thing as this. So anytime I press V, to, to the, which is to the right of C on the keyboard, it uh, turns on on all keyboards, regardless of the layout, um, you'll go that way. Uh, if, uh, if you press C, uh, it'll go back. Um, the other one uh, that's, that's good to know, so let's do a couple more. So the, uh, zoomed in. What if I want to go back to the beginning of where it is that the plot started with, which is this home button, right? You just press H. And so that gets you back in there. So that's, that's useful. I use that all the time. So uh, next to O, you have the P key, which is the panning. So that changes it to a hand. And now you can do the, the sort of stuff that Fernando was doing. So um, I do that all the time. So switching between O and P, sort of zoom in or zoom out. Um, ONP. Any questions on that? It's not terribly enlightening, but it's very useful. G. G. Oh, oh, yes, yes, yes. Oh, thank you, thank you. Uh, so G is the grid when it works again. Uh, sorry, I guess I'm losing mouse focus. That's what's going on here because um, the mouse is sliding off. So G is will set the grid and unset it. And what, what else did I have? I said O P eight. L, G, H, C, B. Yeah, covered them all. Um, all right. Uh, so let me. Oh, so the other thing, the, 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 one of the ones that Fernando glossed over is that you have these uh, subplot parameters that you can configure. And this is actually um, adjusting the height of. So this is when you're like getting ready to do a publication and you want to fit that title just nicely or you want to scoot it over. So you can adjust it you know, from the top or from, from the left and the bottom and whatever. And then there's this thing called H space and W space. And you might say, well, that's not doing anything. Uh, that's because it toggles the horizontal and uh, vertical space between multiple subplots. So if we were to do, uh, let's try it. If we were to do a two by two. So how do we do that? Subplot. Some of you may have. The little control window that you get may look a little different. It depends on which GUI toolkit you're using. That little window that Paul is using may look different, but it contains the same functionality. So this is subplots. Go back to adjust this thing. And now 
you see what I'm doing? The W space and that, and then the H space does it. By the way, the mnemonics are H is for height and W for width. Yeah. I can never. I you know the yeah I have a thing against mnemonics or for them or something because like in the IPython notebook it's uh, you know control M A to put something above and control M B to put something below and I always think oh do I want it before or after and it's exactly opposite <laughs> okay. and and there's another we thing that a lot, by the way. what we debated that I know <laughs> which one to use but we have to make a choice yeah. Yeah, and the, the same thing with uh, this vertical and horizontal splitting, what it means to split vertically and horizontally. Um, so this is what we do on our Friday nights, um, <laughs> is we just debate on the list what the merits of one versus the other. So I'm going to do another example. So this is the slider demo. So some of you may not have seen uh, this plot pop up the way that, Fernando, I hate your window manager. Um, this is being recorded, so this is <laughs> permanent record of my hate of your window manager. <laughs> um, uh, you might have not seen some uh, uh, these nice little widgets that you get in QT. You might have seen something like this, uh, which, which um, uh, might have seen these little blue things that allow you to click in a different spot and adjust uh, the H space, W space, and the um, all those parameters as well. So, so this is this is a little example that you can see. And so we're doing event handling as I'm clicking something in my figure. The the actual uh, one of the drawing axes is changing. I actually have these little radio buttons. So if I want to change the color of this thing, I can do that. And so and this will work on any sort of uh, interactive backend that Matplotlib uses. So you didn't have to specify like a QT or a WX specific application, it allows you to just click on things on the um, on, uh, directly on a little axis here. So, um, so here's the key press demo. So, um, let me go through the code a little bit here. So, well, the 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 main point is uh, which which key is it that we press. And so I think if I press the X key here, what happened? What do you see? You have to scroll a little bit so that. Oh, what? Yeah, can't really see. What? I, I'm looking at the. Sorry, I, I just I just remember that it's the X key. I haven't shown the code to, that, that does it, but um, here. Is this? Well, this is. Um, but basically, you could, so there's the browser on press. I think it was above. It, yeah, sorry, it scrolled off. That's why. Okay, thank you. <laughs> so I'm like, it shouldn't be that long. Um, okay, so here's, here's a little function that we define that when we have an event, uh, that event is going to get passed to this function so long as we hook it up in this matplotlib connect sort of way where we say, oh, give me a, all the key press events that you're going to see. And uh, so that's going to pass it an event. An event has an attribute called the key. So it checks that if the key is x, then we're going to set the xl to be visible. Uh, we're going to get its current visibility. And then we're going to uh, flip it and make it whatever it currently is to, to the opposite of whatever it currently is. Right? So this little thing, so we can, you can imagine just very quickly uh, making y do something interesting, you know, if event dot key equals equals y. And what should we have it do? Uh, how about we do? Okay, so xl dot set color to um, well, this, so this will work at once, but um, you, want get, you want to get the color to see if yeah. it's red, and then All right. otherwise, Sounds good. Make my yeah, right, exactly. yield, have it yield a random color. <laughs> random that random that choice. Uh, you want me to do that? Just do it. Do, do it. 
God, you guys are so... You made an open-ended... Yeah, it's true. I know. I should have... Uh, it's all great to me. I mean, this is on this much medicine. I'm totally fine. You guys are the ones that have to sit through this. This is like not even a second in my current space-time. Um, so, uh, well, let's flip between two colors. Uh, Maybe if C equals equals red. Do you know that they come back as a string? They come back as RGB? Uh, yeah. Well, if I do an else, uh, well, yeah, you're right. Damn it, Fernando, why do you have to be right? Um, well, we'll just do it once. Screw it. We're doing it live. <laughs> doing it once. Um, we're just going to make it blue. So shift enter. And so there you go. So X makes it disappear and appear. And Y. Ah, what, what happened? So it did, it did see that I pressed something. Oh, I pressed the wrong key. No, it got that I pressed Y. So what happened? I didn't draw, right? I didn't draw. And how to, one way to make it redraw is just to resize the figure. If I full screen this. Right, I should have, I should have had, like we had a call to fig canvas draw here, I should have had another one. Or you, really, you could move this call out to here somewhere so it does it sort of at the end. Right? Does that make sense? Yes? Uh, bottom left is usually zero zero in axis coordinates, but in there's different there's different ways of uh, um, sort of traversing that. And I think in figure coordinates, there there's such a thing as figure coordinates, and at the top left is figure coordinates, and that's I think inherited from like x11, something like that. But usually, typically, yeah, the bottom, this is in axis zero zero, and this is in axis one zero. So x is one. And uh, y is zero, and then uh, you know this is one one and uh, the, zero one. If I remember correctly, the event object gives you both coordinates. Okay. So you don't have to do the transformation. If I remember correctly, yeah. when you get an event, you get both the data coordinates and the axis coordinates okay. for the, where the event occurred, so that you can write your logic to make everyone make sense. The documentation actually explains all the fields that the event object has. So it has key cor data it's coordinates, uh, axis coordinates, and a bunch of other. Um, yeah, so, 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 yeah, we're going to get into that. So, so this, we just dealt with the key press event. And so one, one little assignment that, uh, that's useful, at least if you're like me, I, I, I page through data a lot. So when I collect my eye tracking data or something like that, just go left and right. So I'll zoom into a certain level where I can see the features that I want to see, and then just go like left and right. And you can hook that up easily. And I have it like with uh, the comma and the period, which is like the less than and greater than signs. You can easily get the current limit, right, the x limb of the axis that you're, you're, you're looking at, and now update it so that it's one, uh, if, it's, if it's the current width plus whatever it was currently at. So that's a very simple thing. With this demo, you just add a few lines of code, and you've got something that because you're going to, to do this, right, you're going to use the object-oriented interface. You're going to be able to just pass a current axis or you can do something like if you didn't pass an axis, it's going to get the current active axis, right? So uh, did that make sense? Or did I just get too excited about this? I got like one nod. <laughs> All right. So, um, so here's, here's another little. So these are, these are just matplotlib gallery examples. So uh, you can also hook up not just, uh, not just key press events, but these pick events. So that's uh, a mouse being, uh, let me just run this. Um, so a mouse being clicked on a data point. So if I click here, nothing interesting happens. But if I click on, oh, sorry, yeah, yeah, thank you. So when I, when I was clicking clicking around, nothing interesting was happening. But as, I, as soon as I click on a data point, it changes another plot down below, right? So that's that's very cool. So that's you know you have some visualization. It's a way of like being able to paint your data and and look at it in different ways and. Um, so, so this is another little useful demo. So, so these are like pick events that, that it's, it's picking up. It's finding the nearest point to 
in your data to where, wherever it is that you clicked, so long as it's within some radius. Because if I click out here, it's not going to change it, right? But if I, once I start getting close, then it's, and it's showing that radius in this demo by itself. So that's cool. So th these are, this is like taking from, from a lot of what Fernando showed you is, is these uh, sort of inline plots, things that you would do for your publications. This is very useful for just exploring your data and trying to get a handle on things. And maybe, maybe uh, you know, you can, you can do things where you have, you have some, some cluster that you're hooked up to and you have a parameter space that you want to explore. And you just want to literally like sit there and click randomly wherever it is that you want whatever it is that you want the initial conditions to be for some problem that you're trying to explore, and then get the results back, update the plot, and then be able to look at it all sort of in one go. For, uh, Stefan? Can, do you have to, when, you, when you use the picture, can you, for example, have an image at the top and click on pixels and have things to the bottom? Yeah, sure. Yeah, anything? totally. Yeah, anything. Yeah. yeah. We're going to do an example with this in their homework. Cool. Great. All right, so that's all I had for, for this MPL event. Uh, any questions on that? I think I covered it all. Um, good. Uh, which one is it? This one? Yeah. Can I close this? Uh, leave this page. All right, so here's the elaborate example. It's going to uh, sort of touch on a lot of the things that Fernando already uh, touched upon, uh, but, but uh, do it a little bit better. We're going to recreate this full graph in matplotlib and it's going to be awesome, I have a feeling. Um, so I'm going to let you take a look at the, any, anyone familiar, anyone not familiar with XKCD? No, OK. We're all friends here. Um, so OK, so I'm going to start off with inline mode. right? And first, I'm just going to get the data. And I'm just going to plot it. So let's see that, what that looks like. Uh, let me do this. All right, so we're in line mode, so I'm going to have all of these. And you have the, the notebook for this, but I'm just going to sort of broad brush strokes here. So I'm going to get x and y and uh, something called intel and inan for inanity, and so I'm going to plot them. And, and you'll notice one thing that Fernando didn't uh, uh, stress but is very useful is that as you plot multiple things, they, the, there's this uh, sort of ring buffer of colors that get, keeps getting updated, right? So, so that's nice. So you don't, you, I know because by default, blue is always the first one, and green is the second one, and the next one will be red, and so on. Um, you can also change this and, and set your own sort of color ring buffer that you like to go, uh, go over. So, so this is a pretty uh, good plot. Let's, let's do some labels. So Fernando already had an example of this. Let's put a legend on it. So I'm just going to um, uh, hit that. So I've inserted this label. And by default, that label isn't going to show up unless I create a legend. That label doesn't, has sort of no meaning. It'll, it may have meaning so that when I can look at an axis' uh, lines object, I'll be able to pick it out out of like, you know, all the labels that are non sort of blank, uh, blank line. But so here we've got a legend that got placed right here. And that's not really ideal. So what can we do there? We can look at plt.legend and see, oh, well, does this work? Plus. Check it out. All right, so um, plt legend takes a argument. So you can specify lines and labels, but you can also do this thing called location, lock. And it, you, you can do it as a string or as this location code. I never really use the location code unless I really um, need to save some keystrokes. But so we're going to, there is the location called best. So that's probably the best, right? I'm just, I'm just guessing. Um, so they pay me to do this. Can you believe it? Uh, Fernando, how to make it go away? OK. So we're going to do that. We're going to look at best and see if it does something sensible. And it does. Cool. So best won't always do the best thing that you want because it's not a mind reader. But it does a pretty good job of like getting out of the way for, for the data that you have. So if we had some scatter plots over here, it might move it actually to the center or something like that. Right? OK, so, but I'm not happy with this because uh, we don't have labels. So we have, to, we have to label our axis. And so here I'm using the pipelot interface just to do x label. I could also do that as 
AX dot set underscore X label. And so human proximity to cat, we've got that. Um, everything's relative, right? If we look back on this uh, plot, there, there aren't really like units here. Oh, there is this far and near thing, but intelligence and inanity don't have units. So let me get rid of those. So everything's relative. So I'm going to set, set the X ticks to be uh, at position 0 and position 0.8, which is sort of the end here. And I'm going to call that, instead of having it display 0.0, .0 and whatever, I'm going to have it display you know, far here and near here. Well, yeah? You can, for this kind of demo, the play button at the top, the first cell run. Okay. It's kind of convenient for showing the one cell at a time. Cool. All right. And the, the, the play plays the next one? Yep. Great. Awesome. Um, cool. Okay, so, so what we just did is we got rid of the, we said the Y ticks is an empty list, right? So that, that, that displays no ticks. So now you know what the different things in matplotlib are called, right? This is a legend. These things are ticks, and uh, the, the little, little guys sticking out are ticks, and then they have labels, right? So, so this is sort of, keep that in mind because then you can, if you want to change the color of these things or access them later, this is, this is how you would do it. And uh, as was mentioned in an answer to a question earlier, this is the sort of thing where you can, so here we did it just as a list. We assigned where the ticks will go. You can actually change uh, something. I have it later uh, down in the notes and under miscellaneous at the end of the uh, notebook. <laughs> something called a locator, which decides where the ticks get placed, whether or not they get placed you know, base 10 or base E or whatever it is that you want, some, some weirdo thing that where you want it one at one, one at three, one at seven, and one at 22 or something like that. And uh, so that's a locator. And then there's also something called a uh, formatter, which will decide that at a given location, how it will represent that, um, that string. And that's actually what plot date does. So plt.plot underscore date will convert a date into an integer. But then when it represents that integer, it converts it back to something that looks like a date. It'll, you know, 2011, you know, slash, or, or whatever. Whatever format you choose for it. Does that make sense? So, so now you know about formatters and locators. It's very useful, for example, if you imagine you need to make a plot, and you, and a mathematical plot in radians, and you want your, your tick marks at pi over 2, pi over 4, fractions of pi, can set a locator that positions it at fractions of pi and the formatter so that it writes in LaTeX pi over 2, pi over 4, instead of 3.14, blah, 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 which is kind of ugly and meaningless in mathematical plots. OK. So the next thing that I'm going to do is, uh, if you follow Edward Tufte at all, he hates boxes. And I, I, I'm not a fan of them either. So we're going to liberate our axes. I actually have a method that in my little, my own version of plotlib auxiliary functions that I call in all my projects, which is called liberate access that does something like this, which is to get rid of these. Now, these things are called spines that are around the axis. And you can actually display uh, what we're going to do is we're going to hide them so that they look like they did up here, right? You, you notice that there isn't a bo there's a box around the whole cartoon, but there isn't a box around these axes, right? So because, because there's no, it's sort of arbitrary to limit your axes that way. They actually extend that way. And so I'm going to press the play. And so, ah, oh, isn't that so much nicer? It's like you don't have these boxes that are, that are just confining you and telling you what to do. And, um, and the, another thing that I did here was I, um, if you were uh, typing along, is I kept around the, the return of the legend call so that I could do this thing. I could set f uh, draw frame equals false. Another way of, uh, so I, oh, let me go through it. So uh, there are axes, like I said, have these spines. And I decided to take the, uh, the top one and make it invisible, the right one make it invisible. And then I said, don't draw the frame, which is the box and the background of a legend. So now, actually, if, if, we, were to, if we were in an active backend and we were to pan this thing, this line would go right underneath. There wouldn't be, it wouldn't be this, this white background that's still a box that's around it that blocks you from seeing it. Or you could also you could get the frame and then maybe set the alpha so it has, has a nice little, uh, maybe set an alpha of like half, like 0.5, and then it'll be, it'll be nice and sort of you could still see it, but then it's, it's, this, it's just nice, right? I mean, that's, that's what matplotlib is about to me. I'm totally high right now. This is great. Um, 
<laughs> All right. I, I don't know how great it is for you guys, but this is great for me. Awesome. All right, so the next thing that, oh, you'll notice this. Oh, oh, this is nice, right? But, but what is that? What is that? That's not nice. What is that? That's ugly. I don't like it. Does anyone know what it is? It's a tick. Ugh. I don't like ticks. Let's get rid of this nervous tick. And how do we do that? Well, we can just set, say, AX axis, tick just the bottom. Don't tick the top. Tick just the bottom for me, please. And uh, play that. Oh, so much nicer. Just got rid of that tick. Uh, okay, well, legends are nice, but now I have to do this color thing, and if I represented this black and white, and if I want to stay true to what the cartoon looked like originally, uh, I really want to label this line, right? You don't want to have to like look back and forth, and if I had more lines than this, I'd have to keep going sort of like, oh, to the left and to the right, and sort of go to the legend. And legend's not the boss of me. I'm going to do my own thing. And what I'm going to do is um, I'm going to annotate it. And I'm going to do this, this fancy thing uh, called keyword arguments. Uh, who knows what keyword arguments are? All right, what are they? Yeah, that's pretty good. Uh, okay, so keyword arguments allow you to, um, um, you, you, you notice that there's a lot of parameters that you can pass any given function. And so here, this function, we're going to pass it uh, text coordinates, arrow properties, and they have this width and head thing. And we're going to do that multiple times, right? We're going to have multiple annotations. And, and then later on, I'm going to keep calling annotate down below. So I'm just going to save it in, into a dictionary. And then the way that you unpack a dictionary to be passed as keyword arguments, things that were, uh, remember we were saying like alpha, Fernando was saying like alpha equals 0.5. So, you know, so uh, I'm getting some confusion. So let me, let me say what I mean. So the way to do, so normally we would do something like plot, one, two, three, whatever. And then, so here's a keyword argument, alpha equals 0.5, right? And I might have multiple keyword arguments listed, alpha 0.5 and color this and that and line with so and so. And what we're going to do is we're just going to make a dictionary out of those. So where the, where the keys are what the keyword arguments were and the values are what we want them to be. And uh, it's actually, if you use the, the sort of the dict way of building, um, um, a building a dictionary, then it just translate exactly. You can take sort of the same code. And uh, so you make a dictionary out of that. And then the way that you pass it to a function is you do this unpacking using a double star. Okay, so that's very useful. I do this all the time because you end up sort of specifying all these things about w how it is that I want an annotation to look like. I don't want to have to pass that and copy paste that over and over and over again. And it, it, it clutters up the code and you forget what it is that it's actually doing. Where so now we say, oh, it's the no arrow keyword arguments. I call it that because here the, um, the head width is, uh, is a specification of how much of an annotation. Uh, an annotation normally uh, you create an arrow which has an arrow head, but here I'm going to get rid of that so that it uh, resembles the plot like we had up here without arrows. It's just a line. So normally, uh, if, if there was an arrow head, it would be you know, like a little triangle sticking out over here. But we're going to go without that, and so you have this sort of label. Like that? Um, That's a Python built-in sort of thing. So it's a standard, standard procedure way of uh, writing functions of something like this. So args here is an unpacking of the argument. So when you, were, when you would invoke, so this is sort of an aside, general Python aside. If I were to foo one, you know, four, and then T or something like that, that would unpack to args. That, that's a, these things get passed as a list. And here, I'm going to un unpack this list. So args is going to be a list in this function. And then if I were to specify things like foo equals 30, then, then that, would be, that would end up in the dictionary of keyword arguments. All right. 
So now that we've got that, well, we had to uh, have this fancy, scroll up back to the top, this you're a kitty thing. And we can actually do that in matplotlib. I don't know why you'd want to, but somebody took the time to do it. It's important. Is that what you were going to say, Josh, that it's important? So you're a kitty. <laughs> That's cool. OK, so I just did that sort of for practice so we could have that to look at. And, and again, I'm, I'm going to use this thing where I, I say kitty keyword argument so I don't have to keep retyping all of these parameters next time I want to create this kitty annotation. The next time I call it, I'm just going to say, oh, here, let me just read the, uh, sorry. Read in the image, uh, show it. So this is I'm reading part of the comic. I'm going to cheat a little bit, and I'm going to just copy paste the the stick figure guy, sort of out of the image and place it in in another axis so that to complete our our thing. So this right now is using this jet color map. If I set it to gray, the default color map, then that looks more sensible. And now I can zoom in to a specific little guy in that image. So what I just did there is I used IM read up here to read in this comic, which, which shipped with the uh, Git repository. And uh, so now I have access to that comic. It happens to be just black and white. Um, and now I can start adding axes and uh, putting in different parts of the comic, different versions of this guy into it, and then annotating the last one with you're a kitty with just passing it just keyword arguments like that. I didn't have to retype that whole big long thing. So that looks pretty close, but it's got all this gunk around it, right? All these labels, and so, uh, well, let's, let's put it all together first. So, so that this axis gets our previous result, right? So I'm just copy pasting. So we've got our intelligence and inanity of statements and you're a kitty. So this all looking better. Uh, let's see, did I want to make any point in here? Uh, I don't have any notes? All right. So then. So I just. I, All right, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to make a little function. This is back to the sort of object-oriented way of things. I'm going to make a little function that says, oh, this is a cleanup axes function. And it's going to take an axes object, and it's going to set its frame to false. So the frame is a, a shorthand uh, way of specifying all the spines, whether or not they're visible. Uh, so it's, and, and also the, that background white image. So it's going to set that to false. And it's going to get rid of the x and y ticks so that there's no more ticks. And then, you guys are leaving, but Fernando's going to talk some more about Mayavi, and uh, I feel like I'm buzzkilling your thing, Fernando. <laughs> Sorry. OK, and so finally, now, uh, so at the end, what I do is I call this cleanup axes, and I change the figure size a little bit so that the aspect ratio looks nicer, and you have your result. Yeah. Yay. Thanks. All right. Some things that I didn't mention is uh, briefly, just two minutes or something, Fernando, is that cool? Um, 40, perfect, OK. Um, is inanity and intelligence are actually different things, right? They shouldn't be plotted on the same axis. Here we just, you know, just for, for fun, we plotted them on the same axis. But you could actually uh, call something called twin x to uh, when you have it. Let me just show you what that looks like. Um, Here's the twin x example. So, so here I, I create a new intelligence, which is normalized in IQ, right? It's, it's out of 100. And I create a new inanity, which is actually an exponential of what it used to be. I create an axis. I plot the intelligence. So that'll be from 100 to 0, basically. And then I twin that axis, twin it sort of along the x. So the x will be shared and overlaid, right? And then it's going to create a new y-axis for the data that I'm going to plot there. And, so, and that data I'm going to plot as a semi-log thing, because now I said that, that inanity is actually an exponential thing. Things get more and more inane, as we've evidenced by this presentation, the longer you go on. So uh, press play here. And so here's what it did. right? So this is IQ on the left, and this is inanity on the right. 
and it just created new axes. And there, if I were to go pan this left and right, it would pan both both of them right at the same time. So it's a shared axis, shared x-axis, but the y scales are actually different. Um, and so here's to do the same thing with labels. Inanity is measured in twits, I decided. And so here we have twits, IQ points. And as a fun sort of challenge homework assignment, the thing that uh, MATLAB, I think, does by default when you do this sort of twin x trick is it'll make this whole thing red, right? Including sort of, or at least I think it's visually clearer if you were to make whatever color this line is, make this whole, um, uh, the, all the ticks here and the label and maybe even that thing, that color as well, so, sort of to differentiate so that you know that, that this scale applies to this line and the other, the linear scale applies to, to that line. Okay? Um, some other things that, that uh, in the notebook is that you can actually do things like broken axis. And so I, I put a link uh, to the broken axis example. And uh, so that's useful when you have like outliers and things like that. Um, and uh, yeah, Fernando told you about how to poke into the all the ax dot methods that allow you to set the different properties. And I talked about RC params and uh, talked about ticks, and that's it. So yeah, thanks. Any questions? So I think I'm going to show them the homework now because I have some people. Okay, so a couple things to note. One is that we posted the solutions to the homework from homework zero, and we're zero indexed. Chris is looking at me funny. You posted the I did. Okay. Um, and then we're, I've now just posted the homework one, which is obviously related to today's uh, set of lectures. I just wanted to go over that with you just very briefly, and then we'll give it back to Fernando. Somehow? Okay. All right, so homework one. Um, the first thing is to reproduce a paper, uh, a, 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 a figure from a paper that you've actually published, if you've published something. If not, try to find a figure like in a recent journal article that you may have read. And your job is to reproduce it um, using matplotlib as best as possible. So many of you may have produced it with MATLAB, and then you can just do this fairly trivially. Or you may have produced it with some old code. And hopefully you still have the data around. If not, you're not really a scientist. Um, so uh, try to reproduce it essentially purely in Python. And what you'll do is you'll hand back to us the Python code, the new figure, and just perhaps a link on the web um, or a screenshot of the old figure so we can compare how well you did. And obviously, you won't be able to do everything exactly the same way, but try to reproduce it as faithfully as possible. This will give you sort of um, that, that belief that you can actually start using matplotlib to actually make your own figures for publication quality. Um, I think that's an important thing to do. Again, if you don't have your own figure that you're really proud of um, or you don't have that date anymore, you should be able to find something on the web that you can reproduce. Um, OK, so the next thing is to uh, basically reproduce this plot. And we've given you the data for that in a bunch of CSV files. And you know, it's sort of, again, a sort of publication nice looking thing. Um, and you'll be able to make use of what Paul just showed you, where you have two uh, different axes on the left and the right hand side. Um, so this is really just kind of a grind it through and figure out how to, how to make it look like this. And then the last thing is something called brushing. Um, so I'll show you an example of what that might look like. The idea here is this: we want you to build a data exploration uh, uh, framework where you maybe um, have sort of a high dimensionality of, of your data. You perhaps you know, have five or six different attributes, and you want to plot you know, attribute one versus attribute two, attribute two versus attribute three, et cetera. So you make these plots, um, and then perhaps you're interested in stuff that's like over here and over here. And what you want to do, if this is 
this is being dynamic, is I might want to highlight this and here, and in doing so, I wind up sort of graying out um, different points over here. And you can imagine taking what, uh, what you already saw from Paul, where now perhaps you click on the points that are not grayed out, and you might get some pop-up information. So I'll let you be fairly um, uh, expansive with, with your approach here. But the point here is that you're going to wind up having to capture mouse clicks on one of these different uh, axes. And you're going to then have to take action all on these other different axes. This whole idea of brushing is something that you can look up on the web. And we give you an example of a code called viewpoints, where you actually can just play around with brushing. So you can grab some example data, um, and you can start sort of building this brushing. To do that, you're going to have to do with event, you're going to have to deal with event registration. And it, it's a good idea that you can, in the map public gallery, there's a section of examples on event handling. So grab a few of those, run them first. They go beyond what Paul showed, and you'll get an idea of the kinds of tricks you need for this for this particular homework problem. And hopefully, this will approach something that you actually would um, actually want to use in your in your daily workflow. Okay, so I'll turn it back to Fernando. Uh, it's pretty pretty clear that we're not going to um, uh, we're not going to wind up getting to uh, work on the homework um, with all of us around uh, so you can start sending us emails as soon as you have questions and obviously we'll wind up having our um, help session on Friday we said from three to five yeah all that stuff is posted already on the web so um, you don't have so I know it's late, and we've covered a lot of ground. Um, so the, the notebooks that we gave you have, have a bunch of this stuff already in them. Um, and we only have a few minutes. So instead, what I'm going to show you is demonstrate uh, one homework problem that I had for you, and, and I'm just going to show it to you, was this understanding images notebook, where your task, and you, you could try to do it um, yourselves, your task was to create, okay, now they've all come up. So th your task was to, given an image file, to create, to create a window where you could see your original image and pan and zoom around it, but also where you could decompose your image into color channels so that you, an image a real image, an RGB image, has a red channel, a green channel, and a blue channel. So decompose them, be able to explore the image so that when you zoom into one, into one of them, you, you're zooming. So this idea of linking all the axes for all of them with, with real images. And then doing channel mixing so that you would construct the grayscale, the, the, a grayscale image both with a, naive, with a naive image blend and with a more realistic model of the human visual system where the, the balance of red, green, and blue is different so that, for example, if, if you, oops, this is what simply averaging the red, green, and blue channels will give you, whereas if you use a better model of, the, of, the, of how, how we perceive color, you'll see that you get better contrast. So these are b very basic image processing tasks, and I give you a couple of images there to play with as well as um, getting an image histogram. I think I failed to recreate an image, so I ended up with the histograms overlaid here. But these were the, the histograms for luminance and for each of the channels. So you have a notebook in there that has already all of this done, and I provided a couple of image files for you to play with so that you could see what this would behave like. The statement is in the main, in the main, in the main problem, so have a look at this. And uh, if, if you finish the very easy homework that, that Josh just gave you in an afternoon, then, then you, can, you can try to write, uh, basically it's a little kind of image explorer that doesn't do any processing, but that shows you how to, how to use MatPublic for understanding the structure of images. But finally, what we're going to wrap up with just a quick demo is with Mayavi. So up until now, we've been looking at MatPublic, which is mostly a 2D plotting library. It has some basic 3D plots, and you can look in the examples at what it does. But for really heavy duty, 3D visualization, what you want to use is a, a package called matplotlib, uh, is, I'm sorry, called Mayavi. And what Mayavi is, it's a beautiful project that uses the VTK C++ library for 3D rendering. 
and it is really a package for heavy duty scientific visualization in that uses OpenGL for rendering the images that allows you to do interactive zooming and panning and whatnot. So let me close this. Okay. So here we go. So here, we don't have time for a lot, but I'm simply going to show you very quickly some of the examples of the kinds of things that, Matt, that Mayavi can do. Because the beauty of Mayavi is that it makes it very easy to do fairly sophisticated 3D visualizations using a li this library that I mentioned to you, VTK, which is a fairly complex library to use. And if you, if you read the VTK, if you try to do VT, use VTK by yourself and you read, you go and look at the VTK tutorials, the book is about that thick. You have to understand this nasty deep class hierarchy. You have to create actors and a pipeline and inject filters and render the scene. Whereas Mayavi lets you do something like this. You have a bunch of lines. You, here you, we've created the x, y, and z coordinates of a set of lines in 3D. In 3D, in this case, there are lines that wrap around a torus. And simply, you say plot 3D, x, y, and z. And you, you, you can control the radius of the tube, which color map. The, the API is modeled after the matplotlib one. So if you know matplotlib, you already kind of know what to do. They're, they're different projects, but they're very similar in many ways. And boom, there you go. There you have a nice 3D interactive fully interactive window, which you can pan, you can zoom, you can move around, you can control the views, and so, excuse me? And this is actually an anaglyphic render of it. So if you have, if you have 3D stereo glasses, you, get a, you, get, you can actually see, see uh, this thing in 3D. So Mayavi is, it's a little bit more heavy duty than matplotlib. You saw that it went between when I clicked run and the image appeared, it took a while because VTK is a large and complex library. But it's a spectacularly powerful library. I'm going to just very quickly show you some of the examples. For example, that was the line plot. If you, need to, if you want to call points, plot points in 3D, same thing, x, y, and z. Very similar to scatter, but now you have points scattered in 3D instead of in 2D. You can have Simple surfaces, you have a surface defined mathematically, sine of x plus y plus sine of 2x minus y <coughs> plus cosine of that, and you want a surface, you just say surf, and that's it. And you get a nice surface plot that you can rotate, that you can... So many of the, the 3D visualization things <coughs> that you see online are actually done using VTK. Mayavi makes VTK very accessible and very easy to use with this MLAB interface, but you still have the full VTK API. So Mayavi doesn't prevent you from using the raw power of VTK. It just means that kind of the 80% of the jobs are quick one-liners like these, where you can get what you need done quick, rapidly, and, uh, and then for really, for more complex things, you have to open VTK itself. Um, for example, it has a flow render. What is flow? Flow is a streamline renderer. So this is a case where you define a vector field, and you can sort of see some weird lines there. If I, so I, if I grab it, I'm now moving a sphere. And what this sphere is, it's acting as a source of point particles. And then VTK will integrate the trajectories from those point sources and generate, generate the streamlines that come from that point source. What can, can you use this for? Well, to understand the structure, for example, of a system of differential equations, the classic Lorentz attractor from nonlinear dynamics, 1963 MIT, when sort of the, the first big chaotic system of chaos theory. These are the these are the nonlinear, the three nonlinear equations that make up the, the Lorentz system. So here you go. You simply create these. You you call you compute that vector field, and then you can. This is a slightly more complicated example where now you are adding a stream tracer by hand. So flow is a simple wrapper, but with a few more lines of code, you can build something like this which is this nice, compl this, this nice thing which is cho it's showing an isocline, one of the uh, surfaces, and here you have the source for the streamlines, and so you can see how the attractor gets built up as the, these are the initial conditions for integration of the ODE, and they all converge into the attractor because it's a dissipative system, so they converge into the attractor. So building something like that, which is a fairly elaborate and realistic thing, being examples, from the Mayavi gallery. So these are all 
I grabbed them with LoadPy, the same thing that Paul was doing. These were all fetched last night with LoadPy from the gallery. And I showed you only the simple ones and one of the advanced ones, but there are some really elaborate ones in the gallery for very, like remeshing irregularly sampled data in 3D, spherical harmonics for those of you who do quantum mechanics, so if you need to plot, and in fact there is one of plotting atomic, uh, orbitals of, of, uh, atomic orbitals of hydrogen by also representing the phase, the phase of the orbitals on the surface. So an actual water molecule being displayed here. It's a very, very powerful library, and what Mojave does is it lets you access it with kind of a limited amount of effort, and it gives you sort of an on-ramp, because these, these examples that I showed you here, as you saw, the, main, the most frequent calls, flow, point 3D, surf, plot 3D, those are just very simple calls, and then if you need, you access, you access the objects themselves. And one thing that I, the, that I want to close with is, let me just rerun this one because it's as good as any, is this is the window where you pan and zoom and, and, you, and you move things around, what are these things at the top? Just like the matplotlib window had a few buttons, so some of these are very obvious. These are views. You want to view on the x-axis from one side or the other, view from the y-axis, view from the z-axis, or the isometric view. Okay, these are just camera positions. This is an outline that lets you, uh, no, this is the isometric view. This changes the perspective correction. This toggles an axis indicator down here. This full screens it. This lets you save, to, like the matplotlib one that lets you save. But the most interesting one is this one. That's the Mojave logo. If you click on this, it takes a minute to come up. What you get is this is everything that Mojave is doing for you. VTK is structured. The, the, the abstract idea of VTK is you build a, a render pipeline where you put actors. Each actor is capable of doing something. You hook them up into a pipeline, and then you call render on that pipeline. And each actor feeds its output to the next output, and you can inject filters in that pipeline. Well, if you click on that icon, you get the actual pipeline. And now you can manipulate everything you want about, about the objects in there. So you can choose. You can add new elements to it. You can add new filters and modules. You can add new elements. So this is, for example, this is the ISO surface. And if I click on the visibility for the ISO surface, you saw it went away. So that was the ISO surface that was displayed there, the green ISO surface. I can turn it off. You, so it lets you control everything about the underlying VTK C++ machinery interactively without having to know all of that. So I've, I've read through the VTK book. It's kind of a nightmare. With Mojave, you need to know very little of it because between the high-level interface and the fact that the GUI lets you control all these things, most things you need to do with visualization you can do from here. And their documentation does have examples. If you go to the bottom, then they do have examples, complex examples, that use the raw VTK API. So you can dig pretty deep. But if you get that far, it's because you really need it. The point is you have an easy way of getting started with very sophisticated 3D visualization that complements matplotlib. Matplotlib does basic 3D, but it doesn't do these kinds of fast, hardware accelerated rendering. So that kind of wraps it up on 2D and 3D data, data visualization, basically with Python. And these are the main tools that most of us use for everything, from interactive one-off things to complicated plots for papers. All right, thanks a lot.